Mary Marlin, presented by Standard Brands, will not be heard today. For a broadcast by King George VI, we take you now to London. America, the British West Indies, Central America, and South America. In a few moments, we shall hear His Majesty the King. This is London. In a few moments, His Majesty the King will speak to his people at home and overseas. He will also be heard throughout the United States of America. Four years ago, our nation and empire stood alone against an overwhelming enemy with our backs to the wall. A test as never before in our history. In God's providence, we survived that test. The spirit of the people, resolute, dedicated, a burnt like a bright flame, a look surely from those unseen fires which nothing can quench. Once more, a supreme attack has to be faced. This time, the challenge is not to fight to survive, but to fight to win the final victory for the good cause. Once again, what is demanded from us all is something more than courage, more than endurance. We need a revival of spirit, a new, unconquerable resolve. After nearly five years of toil and suffering, we must renew that crusading impulse on which we entered the war and met its darkest hour. We and our allies are sure that our fight is against evil and for a world in which goodness and honor may be the foundation of the life of men in every land. That we may be worthily matched with this new summons of destiny, I desire solemnly to call my people to prayer and dedication. We are not unmindful of our own shortcomings, past and present. We shall ask, not that God may do our will, but that we may be enabled to do the will of God. And we dare to believe that God has used our nation and empire as an instrument for fulfilling his high of purpose. I hope that throughout the present the crisis of the liberation of Europe, there may be offered up earnest 
continuous and widespread prayer. We who remain in this land can most effectively enter into the suffering of subjugated Europe by prayer, whereby we can fortify the determination of our sailors, soldiers, and airmen who go forth to set the captives free. The Queen joins with me in sending you this message. She well understands the anxieties and cares of our women folk at this time. And she knows that many of them will find, as she does herself, first strength and comfort in such waiting upon God. She feels that many women will be glad in in this way, to keep vigil with their men as they man the ships, storm the beaches, and fill the skies. At this historic moment, surely, for not one of us is too busy, too young, or too old to play a part in a nationwide, a worldwide vigil of prayer as the great crusade sets forth. If from every place of worship, from home and factory, from men and women of all ages and many races and occupations, our intercessions rise, then, Please God, both now and in the future, not to remote, the predictions of an ancient psalm may be fulfilled. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will give to his people the blessing of peace. heard a broadcast by King George VI of Great Britain. And now here's a summary of air action in the invasion. 10,000 tons of bombs cleared the way for the Allied army, and as the attacking planes swept through the French skies, only 50 German planes rose to oppose them. Allied aircraft ruled the skies, not only over the invasion beaches, but also far inland. The first official report of the greatest aerial operation of the war said that the Allies made 7,500 sorties between midnight and 8 a.m. In Parliament, Prime Minister Churchill said that an armada of 11,000 first-line planes sustained the assault. The 7,500 sorties between midnight and 8 a.m. did not take into account the hail of bombs, rockets, and bullets that crashed down upon the French coast in the hours following. During the period covered by the report, more than 1,000 British heavy bombers filled the night with thunder. At dawn, the American 8th Air Force sent another fleet of more than 1,000 heavies into the air. More than 500 medium bombers and hundreds of British and American fighters were out during the same period. 
In the light of Reich Marshal Goering's order of the day, in which he instructed the German Air Force to repel invasion, even if the Luftwaffe perishes, there were only two explanations why the German Air Force did not put up a fight on D-Day. One was that the enemy was caught flat-footed, without enough planes in France to fight effectively, although it was estimated that the German Air Force had 1,750 fighters and about 500 bombers in the West to meet the Allied thrust. The other was that the Nazi pilots were afraid to fly in weather braved by the Allied airmen. Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force described the weather as very bad for flying. There were brief thunderstorms over the channel and clouds 5,000 feet thick in some places. Then more than 1,000 American liberators and flying fortresses took up where the RAF heavies left off, unloading possibly another 3,000 tons of explosives on gun emplacements and other defensive works. In its first report on general air activities, the uh, German opposition was described as light. After a night of heavy air bombardment and incessant attacks against the invasion coast, an effective cover for our troops and naval forces was maintained throughout the morning, headquarters said. Air opposition has so far been light. The air attacks began shortly before midnight when well over a thousand heavy bombers of the RAF Bomber Command opened up on the German coastal defenses. During the night, troop carriers and gliders of the U.S. 9th Air Force and the RAF flew paratroops and airborne infantry into the zone of operations, while light bombers of the 2nd Tactical Air Force attacked road and rail junctions and bridges. At daybreak, more than a thousand heavy bombers of the U.S. 8th Air Force and waves of U.S. 9th Air Force medium bombers took up the air bombardment of gun emplacements and defensive works in support of the landing operation. Fighter bombers made repeated attacks during the morning on gun batteries and communications in and behind the assault front. The fighters have been out in large numbers, supporting the heavy bombers and covering the land and seas operations. There were so many Allied aircraft in the air that you almost had to put your hand out to turn, said Lieutenant Colonel Frank Perigo of New York. More than 350 marauders made repeated dashes across the channel and blasted a wide strip of the coastline in the zone of operations, encountering icing conditions that forced many to fly below the normal medium altitude, bombing at a level so low that concussions rocked the planes. Twin-engine lightnings patrolled the skies continuously, guarding the fleet of naval craft and landing boats from an aerial attack which did not materialize. Thunderbolts flew a protective umbrella for troops moving into the continent. Other P-47 fighter bombers attacked railroad and highway bridges, road bottlenecks and coastal batteries in the invasion zone. Some descended to treetop level and strafed German troops moving by trucks to defense of the beaches. There were literally hundreds there, the targets including airfields, anti-aircraft towers, and gun emplacements. Every plane in the big fleet of C-47s that flew the first troops and equipment on the continent were painted with broad zebra-like blue and white stripes and carried colored lights. The stratagem appeared to have prevented any repetition of the Sicilian episode in which many troop carriers accidentally were shot down by their own anti-aircraft batteries. The brightly lighted armada, which was traveling only a few hundred feet off the ground, stretched for more than 200 miles. It attracted only small arms fire, mostly from machine guns, as they drove into France to the dropping zone. The war paint was added to the plane's fuselages a few hours before the takeoff. The lights were added to help keep the pilots in formation. The Allied Army of Liberation rammed Hitler's West Wall today with many secret weapons in use for the first time. While not disclosing the types and actual number of these weapons, the Ministry of Supply said factories had been manufacturing them for many months under the greatest secrecy. Those are the latest developments reported by CBS World News. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Irene Beasley Neighbors Program, usually presented at this time over some of these stations by the makers of Snowdrift, will not be heard today. CBS World News now presents Alan Jackson, substituting for Bob Trout, who is usually heard at this time. Mr. Jackson. CBS reporter Bob Trout, who usually holds down this new spot, is home this afternoon, sent there for a much-needed rest. As you probably know, the CBS network has been on the air continuously, not only all today, but also all during the night. Trout and others carried on nobly in the early morning hours, 
and now are resting up for another go at it later on this evening. The news reports of the invasion have been very encouraging ever since the first official announcement was made shortly after 3.30 Eastern wartime this morning. Our losses have been surprisingly light. Our gains, as far as can be determined, unusually good. First of all, suppose we take a look at two late reports. They are both from the enemy and should be taken with perhaps a grain of salt. But for the Vichy radio says 200 Allied ships have been sighted off the coast above Caen, where new landings are expected shortly. The landings continue in the Vire River estuary area at the southeast base of the Cherbourg Peninsula, according to Vichy. The German Transocean News Agency says, too, that the Allied offensive area has now been extended to the entire Norm Normandy Peninsula of France. Well, the Allied invasion armies landed in northwestern France this morning have now driven at least nine and a half miles into the vaunted Nazi West Wall to the town of Caen. And after 12 hours of fighting, they held beachheads on a broad front along the coast of Normandy. Prime Minister Churchill told Commons late today that the invasion is proceeding in a thoroughly satisfactory manner. And simultaneously, a Supreme Headquarters spokesman said, the American and Allied armies have gotten over the first five or six hurdles in the greatest amphibious assault of all time. Churchill, making his second appearance of the day in Commons to report on the invasion, said, in announcing satisfactory development of the invasion, the troops have penetrated, in some cases, several miles inland. Lodgements exist on a broad front. He said Allied forces were fighting inside the town of Caen, that's nine and a half miles inland, and about 30 miles southwest of the Havre. Earlier Berlin broadcasts reported fighting on both sides of the town, as well as Allied landings all around the broad reach of the Norman coast, from the tip of the Cherbourg Peninsula to the Seine estuary. And Churchill added in his second appearance in Commons, many dangers and difficulties which at this time last night appeared extremely formidable are now behind us. The passage of the sea has been made with far less loss than we apprehended. Here's another German report. The German-controlled Vichy radio says that violent fighting was taking place on the islands of Guernsey and Jersey. That's west of the Norman Peninsula. General Eisenhower's Supreme Headquarters in Britain exudes optimism today. There it has been learned that opposition in all quarters has been less than expected, that Allied naval losses are very, very small, that the landings were postponed 24 hours by foul weather, that our casualties were less than expected, that coastal gunfire is sporadic. Only 50 German planes were sighted up to noon. From midnight to 8 a.m., 10,000 tons of bombs landed from 7,500 Allied planes and still, the air formation hits the Germans in ceaseless waves. Enemy propaganda at a time like this is exceedingly interesting. There is one almost humorous note. In fact, it is a humorous note out of the Far East today. Tokyo Radio has broadcast a statement by a former secretary to the Japanese embassy in Berlin. This former Japanese secretary in Berlin said... The landing operations on the European continent must be highly welcome to the Germans. And he added, there is every possibility that the enemy will be fatally caught in a death trap elaborately laid by the German high command. And the Japanese official took the view that the Nazis have been eagerly awaiting D-Day as the signal for a counter-invasion against the Allies. And he went on to say that he could well imagine the jubilation in the German high command on receipt of the news of the invasion. Well, that's what Tokyo says. It hardly jibes with what Berlin has been putting out most of the day. German propagandists are playing the same old tune, telling the people of Europe that the invasion from the West was undertaken at the orders of Moscow. The CBS shortwave listening station in New York heard one Nazi broadcast after another denounce the Allies for following Moscow's command, thus continuing to the very last moment their propaganda campaign, which has been such a conspicuous failure, that is, the campaign to divide the United Nations. Berliners today are both calm and excited, both confident and fearful, that is, if you believe German broadcasts. Some accounts have told you that Berlin showed its usual face, with no sensation, no crowds, no extras, no special radio announcements. But Berlin newspapers came out with headlines that Europe's great hour has struck. Nazi propagandists proclaimed that a most decisive defeat will be inflicted on the Allies, but soon cautioned the public that the Allies will not be defeated easily. Well, it's a tightrope walking in Berlin between overconfidence and over-anxiousness and fear. One German broadcast admitted frankly that it came rather as a surprise to German listeners that the invasion started so soon after the fall of Rome. Nazi puppets throughout Europe, as you may well imagine, have been mobilized to discourage the people from aiding the Allied invasion forces. Marshal Pétain appealed to the French to comply with all German orders, 
and then asked the French government employees and railroad workers to remain firm at their posts. And the fascist leader of Croatia has warned that the success of the Allied invasion would mean a Jewish Bolshevik rule in Europe. The Germans were quick to report the invasion, eager to come out first with the news, in order to get across their version of the battle. Not even Nazi propagandists could deny the success of the first landing operation. They said the attack extended all the way from the tip of Normandy to the mouth of the Seine, and envisaged landings further east, perhaps as far up as the Somme. Judging from the extent of the area, as well as the number of ships employed, said one enemy broadcast, the attack of the Anglo-Americans against the Seine Bay and Normandy is a large-scale operation. And this broadcast pointed out that the Allied convoy approaching Cherbourg was escorted by 12 battleships and 80 destroyers, and opposed by nothing more than German speedboats and German torpedo boats. Again and again occurred one particular German phrase in this propaganda, a phrase very well known from the campaigns in Russia and Italy. This phrase was, the enemy is many times our superior in men and material. But then tacked on to these admissions, including an order of the day for Marshal Hermann Goering to the German Air Force, that the invasion must be fought off, even if it means the death of the Luftwaffe, came false claims of heavy Allied losses. Severe damage was inflicted to Allied naval forces, said one enemy broadcast, while shortly thereafter, Allied headquarters in London reported very, very small losses. Similarly, Berlin claimed that our parachute formations were almost wiped out. And a few hours after the invasion began, Berlin already carried alleged statements from Anglo-American prisoners, who, of course, all expressed their satisfaction that their skin was saved. That is, according to Berlin. Well, all of this, of course, points up to the warning given today by Elmer Davis. Despite the fact that the Germans were the first to come out with the report of the invasion, OWI Chief Davis warns Americans that German broadcasts should not be relied on in the future. He says the reason the Germans made the announcement was possibly so they could build up a reputation for accuracy and put one over on the Allies later on. Remember, Davis says, Mr. Goebbels is in business for his help and not for our help. And he warned further, the only information on the development of the invasion that can be relied on will be issued by Allied headquarters. News of the invasion has been received with widespread jubilation and prayers both in this country and in other Allied nations around the world. For instance, in Russia, news of the Allied landings spread swiftly through the Soviet Union and touched off enthusiastic demonstrations such as rarely have been seen since the war began in that country. American war correspondents in Moscow were the first to break the news, and they were quickly surrounded by cheering crowds who rushed to shake their hands and offer congratulations. Radio Moscow's chief announcer, who customarily reads only Premier Stalin's orders of the day, broadcast General Eisenhower's special communique announcing the landing. He read the bulletin in a solemn and triumphant tone, rivaling his best performance for the Red Army's biggest victory announcement. Soviet war marches, Yankee Doodle, and the triumphal music reserved for Stalin's victory orders followed this bulletin. For two weeks now, the Russian people have been expecting the invasion to begin at any moment, and the question on everyone's lips in that country was, has it started? The Soviet people now are waiting for their own armies to strike from the east in the coordinated offensive mapped out at the Tehran conference. And allied leaders, that is, unofficial leaders, say today that this Russian offensive may get underway very soon, perhaps in 48 hours, perhaps in a week. But it is certain to come as a coordinated blow timed in with the allied invasion from the west and the allied push up the Italian peninsula from the south. Incidentally, when the allied soldiers in Rome heard the news of the invasion today, they cheered, as might be expected. And according to a broadcast from London, which Columbia's shortwave listening station heard here in New York, they wished good luck for their partners in the West. A BBC correspondent reported that a couple of Tommies I've just met on an outside road made a typical comment. They said, oh boy, that news looks fine. Western Front, now we're on the job smashing a Jerry together. We'll be meeting them. Good luck to you lads over there. We're coming to you. We're all coming in on Jerry now. Such was the comment of a British Tommy in Italy when he heard the news of the Allied landings in Western Europe. Here in the United States, this is not a day of celebration. The reaction has been, rather, to pray and to work harder to see the day of victory. President Roosevelt will reflect the mood of this invasion day when he asks the nation tonight to join him in prayer, a prayer which behind blackout curtains in the White House he worked on last night which he read to Congress at noon, a prayer which asks for victory 
and safety for the American forces in the greatest military ever undertaken. The President can be heard on CBS Network tonight at 10 o'clock Eastern Wartime. Secretary of State Cordell Hull joined the other leaders of the nation in expressing his confidence in a great Allied victory. The Secretary of State said, Our brave Allied armies, today waging the most pivotal battle of all time, never more truly represented the cause of liberty and of mankind. And throughout the country, every man and woman, young and old, felt the impact of the news and reacted in various ways. Maybe just in silence, and maybe some said simply, this is it. Many went to churches to pray. In Washington, the thousands of government workers went to their jobs as usual, but perhaps with a little less to say. War workers, too, just paused long enough to hear the reports over loudspeakers and then went back to work. Some foremen said they went back to work with a fury never before observed in their war work. In New Orleans, church bells ring out today, and in the old French quarter of that town, the tricolor of the French Republic waved beside the banner of the French Committee of National Liberation. On the West Coast, in gay, hilarious Hollywood, news of the invasion was received at 12.32 a.m. Pacific time, in the early hours when nightclubs on Sunset Strip were still entertaining film celebrities. But bands stopped in the middle of what they were playing while the announcement was read. And in most instances, the crowd stood in silence and then started homeward, but not to sleep. Reports from the West Coast Movie Center say that at 3 a.m. Pacific time, the entire city seemed awake. Here in New York, many didn't even know the invasion had started until they awoke this morning and turned on their radios or looked at their morning newspapers. World-famous Times Square was almost deserted when the news came out, but where there were people, there were no demonstrations. Mayor LaGuardia has called upon the people of New York to carry on at their jobs and give the men of the invasion forces their utmost support. He announces that there will be a mass prayer meeting this afternoon at 5.30 in New York City. Right now, here in the nation's largest city, the streets look about as usual. Crowds of people walking down Fifth Avenue, buses and taxis carrying their passengers to work or shop. But the expressions of those you meet would tell you, if you needed to be told, that this isn't just an ordinary day. It's a sobering day that we won't forget for a long time. It's D-Day. There's a very interesting little story about the Navy that came from Washington today. It's told by Admiral Royal Ingersoll, commander of the Atlantic Fleet. And he tells how, of all things, coffee cups were among the weapons used by American destroyer men to repel a boarding attempt of a German U-boat crew recently. The destroyer, which he did not identify, rammed the submarine and rode up onto her deck. Then he said, members of the U-boat's crew poured out of the conning tower and attempted to board the destroyer. The destroyer crew opened up with everything, and that included coffee cups. The cups bounced off the heads of some of the German crewmen during the sharp and desperate fight. The only casualty to the American sailors came when a husky seaman bruised his fist in knocking a German seaman over the side. Then the submarine backed off rolled up again to drop depth charges, and in the second attack, an American seaman tossed a grenade into the submarine's conning tower. The U-boat roared into flame and then sank. Incidentally, an eyewitness report, a brief description of it, says that 600 naval guns opening fire on the French coastal stretch west of Le Havre this morning laid down a mighty barrage of 2,000 tons of shells, each 10 minutes, beginning at 5.15 in the morning. You have been listening to Alan Jackson in a summary of the latest developments brought to you by CBS World News. The address by A.A. A. Burl, scheduled for this time over most of these stations, and Bright Horizons, usually presented at this time by the makers of Swan Soap, will not be heard today. For a special broadcast, we take you now to London. This is London at 9.30 p.m., just 12 hours from the time of communicating number one. In a moment, we hope to establish contact with our American radio reporter, Merrill Muller, covering General Eisenhower, Eisenhower's headquarters somewhere in England. Go ahead, Merrill Muller.
This is Merrill Muller reporting from the advanced Allied Command Post of the Invasion Forces. Allied Naval Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey. Go ahead, Merrill Muller. Today made two startling revelations on the initial operations of the Second Front. First, he said the Allies were 100% successful in putting the original assault forces ashore in the beachhead. The Naval Command had planned on a 10% loss of landing barges in running the minefields and artillery fire to the beaches. But the lack of German resistance made the initial amphibious phase amazing. The only naval losses suffered were light combat vessels that suffered few casualties and did not affect troop landings. Second, Admiral Ramsey officially announced the innate invasion of Europe had made a false start on Sunday night when vessels which had put to sea were called back on account of weather. You will remember earlier I told you some of the invasion convoys had to refuel before sailing last night. This was the reason. The Allied Naval Commander emphasized again and again the important part ideal weather conditions played in the plan of attack. In a special conference at this headquarters, only eight hours after H hour, Admiral Ramsey added, and I quote, We have broken the crust and started off on the right foot. We have caught the enemy on the wrong foot. Now we must try not to give him a chance to regain his balance. I have always said that given the weather and a reasonable amount of luck, we could put the army on the other side. We expected some opposition on the way over and a bit of a tussle with their shore batteries, but we felt we could overcome that. Frankly, we believed that a surprise was unlikely. Admiral Ramsey expressed surprise by the lack of German reconnaissance last night, the answer to which he said he did not know. We've got through the defended beach zone, the British Admiral continued. As I have discussed it with General Montgomery, we have made it possible for him to fight a land battle but we still have a long way to go before we make it possible for Monty to win that battle. We must put in the reinforcements that ends the report from Merrill Muller from General at the Eisenhower's time and place he wants somewhere in England. We return Admiral now Ramsey made it to plain the United that the States. Force... You've been listening to a report from Allied headquarters somewhere in England by the American radio correspondent Merrill Muller. And now for a special broadcast from the radio gallery of the House of Representatives and interviews with congressional leaders, CBS takes you to the Capitol building in Washington, Bill Henry reporting. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bill Henry speaking to you from the radio correspondence gallery in the, in the Capitol building, the radio correspondence gallery of the House of Representatives. We have here today quite a representative gathering of the congressmen and congresswomen who have enjoyed, like all good Americans, the noise and the news that has come in, and we have enjoyed, we not only are enjoying the news, but we are also worried, I'm quite sure, as to the outcome, confident as we may be. Today, I think to speak first to us, I'd like to speak to a veteran of the last war, a Congressman Melvin J. Moss, a Republican of Minnesota, a member of the Naval Affairs Committee. Congressman Moss, do you have any particular reaction to the first news of the invasion? Well, of course, it's a relief to know that it has started. However, we mustn't take the uh, initial starting as the end. This is the beginning, and while naturally we're all jubilant, this is a serious occasion and should sober us. This is not a carnival. There are going to be thousands and thousands of boys die, and we should uh, take this as a sober moment. Congressman, I take it that you speak from experience, not only your experience from the last war, but also from your experience in the South Pacific when things were definitely very tough for us. Is that correct? Yes, I have, like a great many other members of Congress who have been in the wars, uh, have seen some of this at first hand. And uh, it's, it's, it's not a carnival. It's not a holiday. War is ne never is. It's a pretty grim business. And I think that the best way we can support the boys that are over there is to carry on in our normal activities at home, not to declare a holiday, not to take one minute off. The best way to support them is for us to carry on and continue to keep the home front at full speed. That's the way to help the boys go full speed over there. Well, thank you very much, Congressman Moss. We appreciate that sentiment, and I'm sure that everyone agrees with you on it. Now, the Democratic floor leader of the House, Congressman McCormick of Massachusetts, Congressman, could you tell us what happened when the news first came in, when you, the House came in session this morning? Well, uh, of course, after the reading of the journal and the uh, uh, prayer by the chaplain, uh, the House, upon my unanimous consent request, 
uh, stood in, si- in silent prayer. Uh, I know what my thoughts were, one of uh, uh, humbleness. Matter of fact, this morning when I first heard of the, the actual invasion that had taken place, a strange feeling came over me, and I'm still possessed of it. Uh, humble feeling. I have the knowledge that young men and men and uh, uh, fighting and dying that uh, we might have freedom, that future generations of Americans might have freedom. Uh, they're fighting with a faith, faith in God and faith in country. They're fighting for a future decent world. And uh, their first job is to fight to win the war for our country's preservation and its continued existence. But I hope that uh, after this war is over, that the next generation of youngsters, most of whom are not un- are yet unborn, will not be engaged in another destructive global war 25 years from now. Thank you and very much, And in order much, to Congress. avert that, we've got to have visionary and courageous leadership after the war is over. Thank you very much, Congressman. I'm sure that we all very definitely agree with you on that. Now, one of the members of Congress... Uh, of whom we're all very proud, is Mrs. Edith Nurse Rogers. One of the eight women members of Congress, Mrs. Rogers, what do you think will be the reaction of American women to the news of the invasion? Well, the women of America have always been brave. They will be brave about this grim and terrible invasion. The mothers and wives and sweethearts who are giving their sons and their relatives the men that they hold dearer than their own life. They believe that after this war, as a result of the victory, that we will have a, a nation reborn or a world reborn. They know their boys are fighting to make a better world. Do you know we have serving as nurses and wax and marines and waves and spas, military services, some 200,000 women. And many of them are serving overseas. Well, Ms. Rogers, I'm sure that uh, every American feels as you do on that point. Uh, isn't it true that uh, your particular area of the United States has not only been extremely well represented in the war, but has perhaps suffered more than its share of the casualties? Oh, yes, we lost a great many men in, in Pearl Harbor. And the poll last August showed that my own city of Lowell lost more men. More men died there than in any other community of comparable size. It's always been a very patriotic city. They've known that this is the greatest moment in the history of the world. Well, thank you very much, Congresswoman Rogers. We appreciate your coming here very much. Now for the sentiment perhaps from uh, the completely the other side of the country, we have one of the younger members of Congress, Congressman Jerry Voorhees, a Democrat of California. Jerry, uh, what are your general reactions to the news of the invasion? Well, Bill, I don't suppose it's necessary for me to say that this is one of the most critical days in all the history of the world. That upon the valor and strength of those paratroopers of ours who are fighting behind enemy lines, and the men storming ashore from landing barges, the men who man the naval vessels in this greatest of all invasions, and the airmen who give them their protection. Upon the courage and strength and the heart of these men depends the hope of freedom of not only their children and generations of Europeans, but of people all around the world. It's not for me any hour of jubilation. Rather, it's an hour to hold one's breath, to pray with all our souls for strength to the arms of our fighting forces, to pray that as many as possible of them may be spared this ordeal to live again as heroes in the world tomorrow, which they've made possible. What those men are giving over there is far, far more than any of us here at home can possibly do, and we ought to live in the light of that fact. But it's also true, I think, that their invasion of liberation is being made possible because, for instance, countless women, humbly and unheralded in this country, have gone to work to take the place of men because other women have cared their children and other women's children to make that possible because boys and girls all over the land have done their humble part to make this great national effort possible because of every man and woman in our whole country who has done all he or she could, whatever it was. And I hope that every one of us is going to be dedicated to doing still more as the days go on. Well, thank Thank you very much, Congressman Voorhees. We appreciate that. Now, representing... 
Uh, another great uh, area of the great northwest of our country is Congressman Carl Munt, a Republican of South Dakota, member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Congressman Munt, uh, how does this thing strike you? Well, my reaction is one of extreme meekness, Bill. It seems to me that those of us at the home front at this time should feel very humble, and I know I feel very futile as we realize that such precious little we can do as the boys and the heroes over there are risking everything in this tremendous military venture. We have succeeded now over the first crisis by landing our troops in the War of Liberation. The big crisis, of course, is yet to come, and members of Congress have been listening over the radio today to the inspiring words of Winston Churchill as he has brought that out very vividly in his two speeches across the sea, that we must be ready for what is to come. As to what we can do here, it seems to me that if each of us will do just a little better, the thing which he has been doing the past two or three weeks in his normal life, put in a little extra time, work a little bit harder so that we can do our share to see to it when the boys come back, this country will be just as free and just as friendly and just as fine as it was when they went away. We can at least do that. Well, thank you very much, Congressman Munt. I'm sure that every one of us feels that uh, we've got something to fight for in this war, and we're all very hopeful that when the war is over, this will be the better world that everyone is fighting for. Now, to represent uh, the area of the South, which has provided so many great fighting men in this war, there is Congressman Edward A. Bear, Democrat of Louisiana. It seems to me, Congressman A. Bear, when I was down in the South Pacific, that everybody I ran into was either from Texas or Louisiana. Uh, there was a very wonderful bomber pilot down there who was quite a friend of mine who did some wonderful work in the skip bombing. I'm sure that... Uh, you represented a district that is extremely well represented in this war, and I'd like to know how this thing uh, hits you right now. Well, Bill, I'm sure that anybody who's familiar with the history of the South will know that the South turns out fighting men. No question about that. Well, and as done. a matter of fact, I think that if the records would, were surveyed today, why it would show that the South probably has more volunteers than any part of this country, because they are ready to fight to defend what they believe in, and they are ready to fight at any time for when they, when they think they're right. And this is definitely one time they are right. And I'm sure the South will give a very good account of itself, not only in Europe, but when our troops land in Tokyo as well. Congressman, have you found that uh, the members have been following the progress of the war on the maps down there in the, uh, just outside, just off the floor? I find that they're not only following the progress of the war on the maps, Bill, but they're certainly following it over the radio. You walk up and down the halls the day of the House buildings, and you can hear the radios coming from every office that's equipped with one to try to keep up exactly what is going on. It's a definite, it's a feeling of, of, of tenseness, I think, and certainly on my part it's a, a feeling of apprehension. Because while the landings have gone well up to this time, according to the reports we've gotten, I can't, I can't make myself believe that it's as easy as it looks. And I, I'm very apprehensive of what is going to happen. I'm very fearful of a trap, maybe. And I think that uh, the, the thought that should be reflected in America, we over here, as is expressed before in this program, we are in this position we're so futile in our efforts. I think the reaction of the Congress today, and we met today, was one of humility, and particularly one which impressed me more than any time I've been up here, is the fact that they haven't forgotten that this is not only a fight for material things, it's a fight for something better. And everybody asked God for his help, and I think that everybody in America should get down on their knees and thank God that we've got America and that we've got America to give to the world to help now. Thank you very much indeed, Congressman Hebert. Now another one of the younger members of the House, uh, Congressman Albert Gore, a Democrat of Tennessee. Uh, I understand, Congressman, that uh, you have uh, members of your family uh, already in the war? Yes. Yes, that's right. Matter of fact, I remember quite well that... Uh, they practically had to hogtie you to keep you from going in the war. That's my recollection of it. You were actually in the service, weren't you, when the president asked you uh, to stay in on the floor of the House? Waived the immunity and had been inducted, yes. Well, I know that uh, everyone respects you for that, as well as for your desire to respect the wishes of the president. Uh, how has uh, this news uh, struck you, Congressman? Well, uh... I suppose I could illustrate that best by saying that I was working in my office last night where I have a small portable radio when the news was news flash came about 12:30 I believe it was that Berlin had reported the invasion had started 
Well, that electrified me, and I lay my papers down, and I became glued to the radio and spent the night in the office listening to the developments over there. Well, I'm glad to know we had some company because all of us have been <laughs> up all night on the news also. The, uh, what, is your, what was the reaction down on the floor, Congressman, this morning when... Uh, well, I, I, I don't think I have seen anybody, any group of men in my life as humble and yet as prayerful as this group of men were. Uh, and what we have done today, although we've had several controversial votes, there has been a listlessness about uh, all that we've done. Uh, we are interested, of course, in what we are doing here, but our hearts, our prayers, our interests, our sympathy are over there with the boys who are doing the fighting. Thank you very much indeed, Congressman Gore. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Bill Henry speaking from the House Radio Gallery and giving you a few words from the members of Congress who have, I think, wonderfully expressed the spirit of humbleness and patriotism that has pervaded this particular session of Congress. Again, this is Bill Henry speaking from the House of Representatives and returning you now to CBS in New York. Back in the CBS newsroom in New York, here is John Daly. The latest reports of the Allied invasion of northwestern France indicate that fighting is now going on in and around the city of Caen, important communication center at the base of the Cherbourg Peninsula. It is much too early to give any clear picture of the fighting now, but it seems heavy in the Caen area indicating an attempt to seal off the Cherbourg Peninsula so that the great port of Cherbourg can be used as a port of entry for our reinforcements and supplies. Caen may well be, then, the scene of one of the greatest and most important battles in this initial stage of the liberation of Europe. Here with me in the CBS World News studio is Mrs. Marguerite Magat, who lived in Caen for seven years and who left it only after the Germans had occupied northern France. Mrs. Magat, when did you finally leave Caen? I left at the end of July 1940, more than a month after the Germans had occupied the city. Well, would you tell us something about Caen, its size and its importance and so forth? It's a city of more than 70,000 people, support and a railroad center, and it also has important industries. Iron ore is brought to the city of Caen, and there in the great foundries and steel mills is turned into steel. Besides the steel mills, there are shipbuilding yards in which destroyers and small merchant vessels can be built. It's the most important city at the base of the Sherbrooke Peninsula and must be captured if we are to shut off the peninsula for the use of the United Nations. Well, Mrs. Marga, do you know definitely that the Germans have been using the steel mills and the shipyards? Yes. In the months before I left Caen, after the Germans came, I saw them myself opening the steel mills and shipping yards and using their products in their terrible war machine, which was to go on and enslave the Balkans. Well, what kind of a country is it, Mrs. Magar? Do you think it's going to help us in our invasion, or is it the kind of terrain easily defended? I think it is going to help us. Caen is in the center of a plain which starts at the flat, sandy beaches of Rivabella on the Bay of Caen. The canal runs from the shore to the city, and the land of both sides is flat. There are no forests just pastoral land, and the Germans will find it difficult to hide their guns and fortifications. What about the people of Caen? Caen is also a city of beautiful old churches and monuments. It has an old university, and its people are gentle and kind, but at the same time they have the French spirit of decision. Do you think that the people of Caen will help the Allied armies? Yes. When the Germans came to Caen in June of 1940, the people were bewildered and frightened. They didn't understand what had happened. They asked themselves, where is our great army? What has happened to France? But in only a few days, the people changed. They heard General de Gaulle speaking from London. And in that month that I was in Caen, while the Germans were there, I could see the beginning of resistance. The Germans were all around them, and there was little they could do. But they defied the Germans in every way they could. Ever since those unhappy days four years ago, the people of Caen have been waiting for the day of the liberation. For some months after I left Caen, when, it was, when I was an occupied friend, I received news of my friends at home, and I know that they were ready and waiting, and are now following the instructions from General Eisenhower to help the armies of the United Nations. 
I have friends in Cornwall, and I know how happy they must feel knowing that their liberation is in sight. People, people all over France are waiting for the liberator and will help them. When the Germans came to court, they announced that they had 200 fifth columnists in the city. The Germans will find now that the Allies have 70,000 fifth columnists working for them. Thank you, Mrs. Marga, and I hope that before many days you will have the happy news that your home is once again free. For a special broadcast, from BBC correspondent Howard Marshall, we take you now to London. The war correspondent Howard Marshall saw the Allied forces landing on the French beaches, and he has returned now to tell you his experiences. Howard Marshall. Well, I've just come back from the beaches, and as I've been in the sea twice, I'm uh, sitting in my soaked through clothes with no notes at all. All my notes are sudden and at the bottom of the sea. So, as it's literally a matter of minutes since I stepped off a craft, I'm just going to try to tell you very briefly the story of what our boys had to do on the beaches today as I saw it myself. I was in a, a, a barge which was due to pick up the brigadier of an assault group, and we were going in with the first assault wave. So we circled round with the various types of vessels opening fire on the beach, which we could see quite plainly in the uh, dim morning light, uh, opening fire on the beach in their own uh, manners and at the appointed time. Uh, first of all, the cruiser started with a, a rather loudly bang. And soon the air grew heavy with the smell of cordite and loud with the sound of explosions. And looking along the beach, we could see the explosions of our artillery creating a great cloud and fog of smoke. Well, we, in my particular craft, picked up our brigadier, not easily because, as I say, the sea was very rough, and we headed straight for our appointed portion of the beach. We could see as we went in that uh, that particular portion of the beach wasn't altogether healthy, and as we drove towards it with our planes overhead giving us the sort of cover we'd been hoping for and which we'd been expecting, as we drove in we could see shell bursts in the water along the beach and just behind the beach, and we could see craft in a certain amount of difficulty because uh, the wind was driving the sea in with long rollers, and the enemy had prepared anti-invasion, anti-barge obstacles sticking out from the water. Formidable prongs, many of them tipped with mines, so that as your landing barge swung and swayed in the rollers, and they're not particularly manageable craft, it would come into contact with one of these mines and be sunk. Well, that was the prospect which faced us on this very lowering and difficult morning as we drove into the beach. I tell you this, as I say, because it was the experience of so many other men at just this same time. We drove into the beach, uh, swinging rather broadside on in the wind and the waves, seeing the jets of smoke from bursting shells near us in the water and slightly further away on the beach itself. And suddenly, as we tried to get between two of these uh, tripod defense systems of the Germans, our craft swung, we touched a mine, there was a very loud explosion, a sudden ring, a shudder, no craft, and water began pouring in. Well, we were somewhere out from the beach at that point. The ramp was lowered at once, and out of the uh, barge drove the Bren gun carrier into about five feet of water, with the barge settling heavily. As usual, by Mr. Hammer, who is unfortunately detained. You've been listening to BBC correspondent Howard Marshall speaking to you from London. And now to round out this period, the latest dispatches compiled by CBS World News. General Sir Bernard L. Montgomery, commander of the group of armies invading France, said this afternoon he was pleased with the initial phase of the landing operations. 
dressed in the familiar Montgomery sweater, with battle dress trousers, the sharp featured general appeared quite happy as he told of a five point recipe for victory he had given his officers shortly before the invasion signal. He listed the five points as one, allied solidarity, two, offensive eagerness, three, enthusiasm, four, confidence, and five, all out effort. The British radio reported in a French broadcast heard by the CBS shortwave listening post that the landing beach west of La Havre was cleared of enemy resistance five minutes after British troops landed at 7.30 this morning, Western European time. A war correspondent with the landing detachment which landed west of La Havre reports, starting at 7 o'clock, a continuous naval bombardment pounded the German positions. The fire was directed against the part of the coast located west of La Havre. Every 10 minutes, 600 guns of the fleet rained 2,000 tons of shells upon it. Allied air forces attacking the coastal batteries did magnificent work. Between 8 and 10 o'clock, Allied fighters penetrated up to 120 kilometers into the interior without meeting a single German plane. The Vichy radio said tonight, It must be admitted that the Allied beachhead area has been considerably widened and that Allied reinforcements are pouring in. Radio France at Algiers quoted a purported German broadcast to Spain tonight as saying Allied troops had landed and gained a foothold in the Boulogne-Calais area of northern France. The report lacks confirmation in any responsible source. It also said Allied paratroops captured an airdrome in the same region. King George VI of Britain, broadcasting to his people tonight, made a solemn call to prayer and dedication that we may be worthily matched with this new summons of destiny. The king said in a broadcast heard on CBS, at this time four years ago, our nation and empire stood alone against an overwhelming and implacable enemy with our backs to the wall. Tested as never before in our history, in God's providence we survived the test. The spirit of the people, resolute, dedicated, burned like a bright flame, lit surely from those unseen fires which nothing can quench. The king continued, now once more a supreme test has to be faced. This time the challenge is not to fight to survive, but to fight to win the final victory for the good cause. Once again, what is demanded from us all is something more than courage and endurance. CBS World News, which is bringing you the latest information from the French invasion beaches, will interrupt our programs immediately to broadcast any news or special programs from abroad. Bachelor's children, usually presented at this time over most of these stations by the makers of Wonder Bread, was canceled today. Broadway matinee, usually presented at this time by the Owens, Illinois Glass Company over most of these stations, will not be heard today. And now, while we wait for more news on the invasion, we will present a musical program. Please stay tuned to your CBS station, which will bring you all news of importance as soon as received. Roswell P. Barnes, Associate General Secretary of the Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America. Dr. Barnes. I have combined the texts of a prayer issued for use on Invasion Day by the Right Reverend Henry St. George Tucker, President of the Federal Council of the Churches of Christ in America, and a prayer issued by the Archbishop of Canterbury for use in Great Britain. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, Father of all mankind, lover of every life, here we beseech thee the cry of thy children in this dark hour of conflict and danger. Thou hast been the refuge and strength in all generations of those who put their trust in thee. May it please thee this day to draw to thyself the hearts of those who struggle and endure to the uttermost. Have mercy on them, and suffer not their faith in thee to fail. Guide and protect them by thy light and strength, that they may be kept from evil. May thy comfort be sufficient for all who suffer pain or who wait 
in the agony of uncertainty. O righteous and omnipotent God, who in their tragedies and conflicts judgest the hearts of men and the purposes of nations, enter into this struggle with thy transforming power, that out of its anguish there may come a victory of righteousness. May there arise a new order which shall endure, because in it thy will shall be done in earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us and cleanse us, as well as those who strive against us, that we may be fit instruments of thy purposes. O Lord God, we humbly dedicate to thee ourselves, our nation, and our cause. Place in thy hands all we have, and all we are, and all we desire. And unto thy most gracious keeping, we commend our loved ones and ourselves, ascribing unto thee all praise and glory, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. The International Division of the National Broadcasting Company, working in close cooperation with the Office of War Information and the Coordinator of Inter-American Affairs, plays its daily and nightly part in the short waving of truth to listeners outside the United States. Throughout the weary years of oppression... The messages which have told us of progress and of growing power have been told to the peoples of every country in their own languages. Throughout the long, early hours of this morning, we waited for the official announcement that would tell the oppressed of Europe that the concluding phases of their liberation had begun. What you who were listening heard, the people of the occupied countries heard, and so did listeners in every country hear whatever was broadcast to you. The question is often asked, but does anyone really hear your shortwave programs? Yes, they hear the shortwave programs from the United States, and by every means open to them, they try to let us know. Letters reach the shortwave broadcasters in the United States. Messages come through other channels. Someday, those thousands whose only light has been shed by broadcasting will be able to tell their stories. Here is one letter received a few weeks ago from a Frenchman. He is today a chief petty officer in the French Navy and on active service. It may be of some interest to you to know that your international program is heard quite regularly in France. In 1940 and in 1941 on the West Coast, and in 1942 on the South Coast of France, I was a daily listener to your shortwave transmissions. Besides, they were not jammed, like the medium waves by Vichy France and the Germans. Listening to your announcer in French yesterday afternoon brought me back memories. It was through your station that I heard that the German Lieutenant Colonel Hultz had been executed by two French patriots, Place Saint-Pierre, at 8 a.m. at Nantes in October 1941. I heard that important news at 6 p.m. on a Monday, and uh, it made quite a change in the course of my life. This timely information was given by your announcer, Victor McCausland, whose voice I so well remember was clear and friendly. Yours very truly. You will understand, I'm sure, why I do not read the signature of this letter. The writer's wife is still in France. This man had made 11 unsuccessful attempts to escape from occupied France. He was a marked man. The shooting of the German colonel by two French patriots was sure to be followed by mass reprisals. The writer of this letter knew that he'd be at the top of this list of hostages. It was through an NBC shortwave broadcast that he learned of Colonel Holtz's death, and this changed the course of his life. He fled, and this twelfth attempt at escape succeeded. He's been to see our French section many times. That is simply one of a great many letters and messages that find their way through to this country. 
Since the early hours of this morning, the news which you have heard here has been told to other countries by the powerful shortwave transmitters of the United States. NBC's International Division has had its share in this work. In the hours that have passed since the news came which galvanized the whole world, its members have told the thrilling story. Throughout the hours of tonight and the nights to come, these same people will continue to recount the unfolding of the story of liberation in eight languages. To give you some idea of the work done here, members of each language section will between them, and in eight languages, read General Eisenhower's thrilling message of this morning. First, in French. Un débarquement a été effectué ce matin sur la côte française par des troupes du corps expéditionnaire allié. Ce débarquement fait partie intégrante du plan concerté des Nations Unies pour la libération de l'Europe, plan élaboré en conjonction avec nos grands alliés, les Russes. J'ai le message suivant à vous communiquer. Quoique le premier assaut n'ait pas été déclenché dans votre pays, le moment de votre libération approche. Now in Italian. Tutti i patrioti, uomini e donne, vecchi e giovani, hanno un compito da assolvere nel raggiungimento della vittoria finale. Ai membri dei gruppi di resistenza, guidati sia da condottieri nazionali che da capi alleati, io dico seguite le istruzioni che avete ricevuto. Ai patrioti che non sono membri di gruppi organizzati di resistenza, io dico continuate la vostra resistenza passiva, ma non mettete inutilmente in pericolo la vostra vita. Aspettate fino al momento in cui vi darò il segnale di insorgere e di colpire il nemico. In Spanish. Esperad hasta que yo os dé la señal de levantarse y golpear al enemigo. Llegará el día en que necesitaré de vuestras fuerzas unidas. Mientras tanto, os pido vuestra colaboración observando una estricta disciplina y un absoluto retraimiento. Ciudadanos de Francia, me enorgullezco de tener otra vez bajo mi mando a las agarridas fuerzas francesas. Peleando al lado de vuestros aliados, desempeñaréis un papel de suma importancia en la liberación de vuestra patria. To Scandinavia in Danish. La den første landgang er blevet foretaget på Frankrigs jord, den tager jeg med endnu større eftertryk mit budskab til folkene i de andre okkuperede lande i Vesteuropa. Følg jeres leders instrukser. Et forhastet oprør af alle franskmænd kan forhindre jer i at blive til den størst mulige hjælp for jeres land i denne kritiske stund. Har tålmodighed, vær berigt. Portugis. Como comandante supremo da força expedicionária aliada, cabe-me o dever e a responsabilidade de tomar todas as medidas necessárias para a prosecução da guerra. A obediência pronta e voluntária às ordens que eu der é essencial. A administração civil eficiente na França será entregue em mãos de cidadãos franceses. Em Swedish. Alla personer måste fortsätta på sina nuvarande poster så vidare de inte får andra instruktioner. Det som gjort gemensam sak med fienden och därigenom förrått sitt land kommer att avlägsnas från sina poster. När Frankrike befriats från sina förtryckare kommer ni att själva få välja era representanter och den styrelseform ni önskar. In German. Im Laufe dieser Kampagne zur vollständigen Niederringung des Feindes mögt ihr zu weiteren Verlusten und Schäden kommen. Sie mögen tragisch sein, aber sie sind ein Teil des Preises, den wir für den Sieg zahlen müssen. Ich kann euch die Versicherung geben, dass ich alles tun werde, was in meiner Kraft steht, um eure Opfer zu mildern. Ich weiß, dass ich jetzt auf eure Standhaftigkeit genauso rechnen kann wie bisher. Die heroischen Taten von Franzosen, ihren Kampf gegen die Nazis und die Vichy-Satelliten in Frankreich und im französischen Weltreich fortgesetzt haben, waren ein Beispiel und eine Ermutigung für uns. And in English. The heroic deeds of Frenchmen, who have continued their struggle against the Nazis and their Vichy satellites, 
in France and through the French Empire have been an example and an inspiration to all of us. This landing is but the opening phase of the campaign in Western Europe. Great battles lie ahead. I call upon all who love freedom to stand with us. Keep your faith staunch. Our arms are resolute. Together we shall achieve victory. This, if you like, is a composite language picture of General Eisenhower's message. It will serve to give you a slight suggestion of the shortwave broadcasting from the United States to the whole world on a round-the-clock schedule. We return you now to NBC's invasion program. And here in the NBC newsroom, a bulletin has come to our attention which points to another theater of war. NBC monitors in San Francisco have just reported that the Tokyo radio has just left the air suddenly and without explanation. I'll repeat, NBC monitors in San Francisco have just reported that the Tokyo radio has just left the air suddenly and without explanation. Now back to the European theater with this bulletin. The secret German Radio Atlantic has just broadcast that the Germans, fearing an uprising of the millions of slave workers inside the Reich, have ordered all work camp and stalactite guards to be on the alert for weapons dropped from the air by Allied planes. Guards have been reinforced and stockades strengthened around the workers' barracks. The NBC monitors heard this broadcast. And at approximately 4.15, ladies and gentlemen... We'll bring you another eyewitness account, a special broadcast from London, a reporter who has just come back from the beachheads. In the meantime, we bring you some music. Now, ladies and gentlemen, for another eyewitness account of the invasion, we take you to London. NBC in New York calling London. Now, the first wasn't talked about very much, except from a purely technical point of view. It was something beyond our control, something desperately important, but, but altogether too big for us. 
something men only discussed in their prayers. But the second we hoped was very much under our control. In spite of the fact that the whole invasion force had had to be trained and embarked within only a few miles of enemy aerodromes, every precaution had been taken to ensure that he didn't find out. A little Yorkshireman, looking round as he stepped out of a lorry and marched down to his landing craft, summed it up in three words. What? No bands? Yes, that was it. Here were thousands and thousands of men going off on what might well prove the greatest battle in history, with no bands, no cheering crowds to wave them on their way. But on the contrary, slinking off and taking every possible precaution to get away unnoticed. From the point of view of enemy action, last night was one of the dullest pre-assault nights I've ever known, and I've known most of them. As far as our own force was concerned, there was no interference by enemy aircraft, U-boats, or E-boats. And our only concern was the high, choppy sea which was playing havoc with some of the smaller craft. The sailors and marines who got those craft across worked miracles. By dawn, the sea still showed no signs of abatement. And as the wind was from the northwest, it meant that the surf would be very, very dangerous in the shallow bay of the Seine. As the assault craft grouped into position, there was a terrific bombardment by cruisers and destroyers, combined with an intensive bombing on the enemy coastal batteries. Almost immediately, the coastal batteries answered back. And although I didn't see any actual damage done, some of their shells fell unpleasantly close to us. Those batteries were soon put out of action. The other main problem was, of course, that of the minefields. Minesweepers, the spearhead of the invasion force, were sweeping ahead of us during the night and were now carrying the approaches inshore. And beyond the minefields, we knew that we must expect a large number of underwater obstructions which must be cleared before the landing craft could have any chance of reaching the beaches. Specially trained volunteers, dressed in tight-fitting rubber sea-green suits and helmets, and looking rather like gnomes, leapt into the shallows to place charges and, and to blow up those, uh, those obstructions. Believe me, they worked wonders. Meanwhile, the assault craft were creeping in. While over their heads, cruisers and destroyers and army guns and their way in put up a terrific barrage, while the Hun did his best to have it back. But in spite of the obstructions, the heavy surf and the minefields and the beaches, all the beaches in our sector were soon gained. And then started that mad rush to get the follow-up supplies ashore at greater speed than the enemy could muster his forces to his counterattack. When I left this afternoon, that mad rush against time and weather was at its height. As I came back across the hundred-odd miles of English Channel to these shores, I shall never forget what I saw. There was no need for any navigation. It was just as easy as walking down Fifth Avenue. The whole way across the Channel, there were continuous lines of craft approaching the Bay of the Seine. And not only continuous lines, but rows and rows of lines stretching out on either side as far as the eye could see. Our navies at this moment are undertaking the greatest task in their histories. May God allow those men fair weather to help them in this great adventure. And that was Commander Anthony Timmons speaking from London. We return you now to the United States. You've been listening to Commander Anthony Timmons of the Royal Navy, one of Britain's smartest naval men. He's been through two wars, took part in the Allied landings in Africa, Sicily, and Salerno, and returned to England recently after taking part in the Allied invasion of the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. He had a front seat there as a British observer. And now for another special broadcast, we take you to NBC in Washington. This is the NBC newsroom in Washington. Just arrived in our studios is the ambassador to the United States from the Netherlands. As a representative of a country along the invasion coast, he brings a brief message to the people of America. Dr. Alexander Loughton, ambassador from the Netherlands. We live through sacred moments. My personal reaction to the stirring news of the Allied landings on the European continent can best be expressed by referring to a beloved but very sick relative. When the early mornings has been put on the operation table while the world's most skilled surgeons are doing their utmost to save his life. Nationally, 
All relatives and friends are impatiently telephoning to the hospital to hear the latest news about the patient's health. And the answer is, operation successfully performed and condition as, satisfac as satisfactory as can be expected under the circumstances. In other words, matters are in the hands of the military. Let them speak and strengthen us. Let no impatience on our part upset the patient's struggle to win. We must have faith in the military, aided by the fighting patriots. For the courage and devotion of all of them, we cannot but feel the deepest gratitude, love and admiration. Our prayers follow them. From the NBC newsroom in Washington, you have heard a few personal reactions to the invasion by Dr. Alexander Loughton, ambassador to the United States from the Netherlands. We return you now to the newsroom in New York. Back once again in the NBC newsroom in New York. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we take pleasure in presenting that noted NBC commentator, Caesar Searchinger, who is also the analyst for the American Historical Association. Mr. Searchinger. Good afternoon. First of all, let me tell you that General Eisenhower's headquarters in London will issue its second communique of the invasion at approximately 5.30 this afternoon, Eastern War Time. This will be the first communication concerning the progress of the invasion. There has only been one before, and that was the bare announcement that the invasion had taken place. So, at 5.30 this afternoon, General Eisenhower will issue the first real communique on the progress of the invasion. The Vichy Radio said tonight that it must be admitted that the Allied back beachhead area has been considerably widened and that Allied reinforcements are pouring in. Yes, it looks as though the invasion were a success as far as we've gone. It's now from 14 to 16 hours since the first Allied troops landed on the coast of France. It is definitely established by now that the main landings were made in the Seine estuary, not far from the port of Havre, that is to say, across the wide estuary of the port of Havre. The landings were made, however, on the south shore, where the fashionable bathing beaches are, such as Enfleur, Deauville, and Trouville. This 60-mile stretch of Normandy coast between the two rivers, the Seine and the Orne, is mostly flat, and hasn't the steep cliffs of the coast north of Havre. Thus far it looks as though we left Havre to one side, though it must be one of our objectives, being the second largest port of France and the nearest to Paris. It was Napoleon I, I think, who said that Paris, Rouen, and Havre were really one city, with the Seine as the main highway in between. Speaking of Rouen, it is stated that our parachute troops are fighting inside the historic city that city where Joan of Arc was burned at the stake. Prime Minister Churchill, in his second speech in Parliament today, said that our troops, ground troops this time, are fighting in the streets of Caen, C-A-E-N, Caen, nine and a half miles from the shore. Caen is an ancient city near the little river Orne, which flows into the sea about 20 miles south of Havre, across the estuary. This seems to indicate that at present we are heading southward, away from Havre. Caen is extremely important as a road junction. One of the main roads going out of it cuts straight across the Cantantin Peninsula, the peninsula that juts out from Normandy towards England, pointing straight at the Isle of Wight. Near the end of that peninsula lies Cherbourg, another great port which would be a valuable bridgehead for us. If our troops were to cut off this peninsula from the rest of Nazi-held France, we would have a large and highly protected area roughly a triangle 60 miles wide at its base and 60 miles from base to apex sticking out into the sea. There are also reports from enemy sources that we have landed on the Contentin or Cherbourg Peninsula direct. It seems logical if the peninsula is our objective that we should land at both ends at once, though the coast near Cherbourg is much more difficult because of the sharply rising hills. It's certain, however, that we have landed paratroopers on the Channel Islands of Jersey and Guernsey, which lie between 20 and 30 miles off the west coast of the peninsula. These islands, as you know, are British territory, having been in English hands since the days of King John. This is the only British territory the Germans held in this war, 
and thus the first liberation of British territory has taken place. All this, the fighting in Caen and the landing of paratroops on the Channel Islands, does point in the direction of our aiming to use the Cherbourg Peninsula as a base of operations, possibly against Paris itself. Caen is a vitally important place both because it is on the railroad from Cherbourg to Paris and because it is the main communication point between western Normandy and the Seine, between Cherbourg and Havre. By the way, the city of Caen, where our soldiers are now fighting, has about 50,000 inhabitants and is a commercial town of some importance. It has close associations with English history, for it is where William the Conqueror came from and was originally buried. The castle, which is still used as a barracks, was built by the Conqueror, and so were the famous Abbey Church, dating back from 1070 and other churches in the town. Later, Caen became the capital of Lower Normandy. It was besieged and taken by King Edward III of England during the previous English invasion of France in 1346, but it was lost again four years later. The University of Caen, curiously enough, was founded in the 15th century by Henry VI of England, who, I believe, also founded Eton College. Caen became one of, the Huguenot, one of the Huguenot towns at the time of the religious wars, and its medieval prosperity was shattered by the revocation of the Edict of Nantes under Richelieu. And now a word about Havre. Havre is the second seaport of France at the mouth of the Seine. It's 143 miles to Paris and 56 miles to Rouen. The name was originally Harbour de Grasse, after the chapel of Our Lady of Grace, which stood there when Harbour was still a fighting village, which was until 1516. The defences of the Harbour are very strong. They were built by Richelieu and completed by Vauban, the greatest of all French engineers. It was bombarded by the English five times in the 17th and 18th centuries, but no landings were ever made. Napoleon raised Harbour to a port of the first rank, and Napoleon III completed the works begun by Louis XVI. In the First World War, British and American troops used the harbor. We used it as a base for landing troops and supplies. It is obvious that we shall need it again for the same purpose. Well, the marvelous thing about this invasion is that we really seem to have achieved surprise, that most valuable thing in all warfare, especially in overseas invasions. Admiral Ramsey of the U.S. Navy says he wouldn't have thought it possible, and he himself was surprised to see no more opposition against our armada. And this, mind you, despite the fact that the operation had to be postponed for a day on account of weather conditions. Of course, <clears throat> against the 4,000 ships and smaller vessels we employed, the Germans had little in the way of ships, a few destroyers and submarines. And submarines aren't much good in the channel because they can't submerge deeply. So... Some things were in our favor, and so far, as I said, it's been a success. You have been listening to the noted NBC commentator, Caesar Searchinger, who is also the analyst for the American Historical Association. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Eastern Wartime, your station, WEAF, New York. This is Don Hollenbeck in the NBC Newsroom in New York. First two late bulletins from London. The German High Command says tonight that great enemy formations appeared at the coast of northern France between Calais and Dunkirk this morning. The great struggle on the northern coast of France has begun. A Nazi broadcast quotes the High Command. If true, this is a threatened landing on a new point of the French coast. The German DNB news agency reports tonight that Marshal Karl von Rundstedt and Marshal Erwin Rommel, Nazi commanders in Western Europe, are on the spot of the developments. Reports on invasion are pouring in, mostly from the enemy in recent minutes, and the enemy is busy making admissions. Admissions that our troops are pouring ashore at many places along the Normandy coast. A German broadcast says allied parachutists have now taken over an airfield in the Boulogne-Calais area, along the Dover Strait. 
That, of course, would be in an entirely new section of the French coast, more than 50 miles up from the earlier announced invasion area, which stretches all the way from Le Havre to Cherbourg. This new German report places the Allies in action directly across the strait from the cliffs of Dover, which, if true, would mean that the invasion is spreading out over a wide area. This unconfirmed news from the enemy says our parachute troops not only have occupied an aerodrome in the Calais area, but they have gained what is termed a foothold in that general area. Shortly before this report, NBC monitors here heard Berlin Radio tell of a fierce naval engagement between Calais and Dunkirk. The British radio says that the Allied invasion line in France is now sufficiently broad to amount to more than just a beachhead. Of course, we know that additional landings are on the schedule. And from the flow of statements from the Germans, these landings are being carried out. Vichy Radio has been heard saying that 200 Allied ships had been sighted off the coast above Cannes. There, where more men naturally would be expected to go ashore to reinforce those already landed and pushing inland. Vichy Radio admits that the Allied beachhead area has been considerably widened and that those fresh troops are leaving landing craft. Fierce fighting is taking place in the islands of Guernsey and Jersey, which lie west of the Norman Peninsula. This is another enemy report. Another German broadcast speaks of new Allied landings in the area of Carentan, just opposite the island of Jersey. I must point out here that all these reports are emanating from the Germans and, of course, must be regarded with great caution. From our own sources, the latest is more or less of a general nature. General Montgomery, commanding the armies invading France, who sent his men into battle with the message bespeaking great confidence and ending traditionally with the Montgomery send-off, good luck and good hunting. Montgomery says he's pleased with the initial phase of the operation. In Washington, Admiral Ernest King said after a conference with President Roosevelt that the invasion is doing all right so far. And here's another German report. Allied troops are said to have won full possession of the town of Enfleur at the mouth of the Seine River. Enfleur is just across the river mouth from Le Havre. The German propaganda agency in a late summary says that the Allied forces hold the coast for 15 miles between Villers and Trouville, which is to the south, across the Seine estuary from Le Havre. Prime Minister Churchill earlier told Commons that our soldiers have penetrated France in some cases several miles inland, and that the first phases have been thoroughly satisfactory with losses far less than was expected. The Prime Minister told us that our airborne landings, the landing of the troops who bore the first brunt of battle, was an outstanding feat on a scale far larger than anything there has been so far in the world. The German report on this is is at least four divisions of American parachute and airborne troops alone had been landed on the Normandy Peninsula. These troops from the sky created a major diversion, many demolitions. War-painted American Indians were among the first of these paratroops to land in France this morning. These Indians are a troop picturesquely self-termed the Filthy Thirteen. They're well-trained demolition engineers, packing 180 pounds of equipment on their lean, hard bodies. As you no doubt have noted, any newscast at this time is well sprinkled with bulletins. That's how fast things are developing. And here's another one. Fifteen Allied cruisers and 50 to 60 destroyers are reported by the Nazi DNB agency to op- be operating west of Le Havre tonight. That's another enemy report. Every plane taking the troops this morning through the purple, cloudy skies of the dawn was painted with broad zebra stripes, blue and white stripes, and the planes carried colored lights. All this was to prevent a repetition of that Sicilian episode in which a number of our own transports were accidentally shot down by their own ack ack fire. That br- brightly lighted armada, traveling only a few hundred feet above ground, stretched out, we're told, for 200 miles. Immediately following this broadcast at 4.45, NBC will broadcast at dictation speed the text of the prayer which President Roosevelt has asked the nation to repeat with him at 10 p.m. Eastern wartime. The prayer is about 500 words long. If you haven't been able to get the text of it, this will be a good opportunity for you to copy it down in time to repeat it with the President tonight. The prayer will be given at dictation speed, 4.45 Eastern wartime, immediately following this broadcast. The invasion, incidentally, was scheduled for yesterday, but was delayed because of the weather. The invasion overshadowed developments on other war fronts, but activity continues on these fronts. Russian armies are understood to be massing for blows against the Germans from the east. In Italy, remnants of the German army are fleeing in disorders toward some new sort of defense line in the northern mountains. The Fifth Army is pouring after the enemy across the Tiber River in many places. Allied communiques say the battle to destroy the enemy continues without pause. And as a footnote to this assault from the west, the south, and soon from the east, Premier Pietro Badoglio announces in Naples that he has dissolved his Italian government, is forming a new administration in liberated Rome. One more bulletin from Washington this time. Secretary of War Henry L. Stimson has just told newsmen that first reports of the Allied landings in France indicated the long-awaited invasion was going very nicely. 
And here's a story overheard by our NBC monitors. The Nazis are suppressing news of the progress of the invasion and withholding the facts from the German people. Radio Atlantic, the German secret transmitter, says in a broadcast monitored this afternoon by NBC. What scant news that is put out by the German home radio is very confused and depressing. The people of Berlin have gathered in the streets and whispering nuts, wondering where the next blow will fall. They know that nightfall and the hours of darkness now ensuing will mean more landings. Their prime question is, where? The clandestine transmitter, located somewhere in Germany, often has accurate reports of what's going inside the country. It's significant, the anti-Nazi radio points out, that though broadcasts beamed to Germany from England repeat the German claims of successes in naval engagements in the channel, the Reich home radio has made no such statements. In all the volumes of bulletins, communiques, announcements, and stories of the invasion today, one great factor hasn't been mentioned. It may be that it's too early to get any reports. That factor is the French underground, the silent, secret army of patriots that has dared so much awaiting this day and which should at this very moment have flamed into action all over France. For days now, General Eisenhower's headquarters has been broadcasting instructions to this underground army, orders as definite and as important as any issued to the Allied troops waiting in England. Just today, General de Gaulle sent them orders from London. He declared that the Allied landings opened France's battle for liberation. Our NBC monitors heard de Gaulle urging Frenchmen to carry on the war behind the enemy's lines, to coordinate their work closely with the frontal attacks by the main Allied armies. And here in the NBC newsroom a few moments ago, we just heard Radio Bratzeville, the free French radio in the Congo, broadcasting that the people of France, following the instructions of the Allied High Command, are prepared to take up arms in back of the German lines as one man. Viva la liberté, long live the United Nations, said Bratzeville. And that's France's reply to the orders of the Allied commanders. So far as we can learn now, no French fighting divisions have yet got into action. It may be, too, that this hasn't been announced, but we may be sure that French troops will be in the van of the march on Paris. Just now, it's up to that hidden army in France to strike where and how it can at the enemy, to follow the orders of their leader, de Gaulle, and of the Supreme Commander, Eisenhower. I know something about this French underground army... In Algiers last winter, I used to meet some of its members who were reporting there for instructions, leaving France at great risk, using false names, crossing the Mediterranean, or sneaking through Spain any way they could, getting their orders and then going back at even greater risk. My French has a good deal of Nebraska about it, but I was able to get the idea of what this underground army was doing, just how important it was to the Allied cause. And I learned enough to wonder sometimes if people at home appreciated that. More if even the Allied leaders appreciated what these underground patriots were up against. It's one thing to be a soldier with the dignity of a soldier and the assurance that goes with the proud wearing of the uniform to carry weapons to march and sail and fly under one's own flag proudly displayed. It's another thing to be a soldier in the dead of night, in the rags and tatters of a charcoal burner in the forest of Compiègne or on the docks of Marseille. He must move silently and swiftly. He must know how to dissemble. He must be able to keep his patriotism, his love of his country under control. He must pretend to bow to the enemy and to his own countrymen who have chosen to side with the enemy. These men we used to see in Algiers had drawn tight old looks about their faces. Even in that bit of liberated France, they were never quite sure whom they could trust, and they did well to be wary. For Algiers and Constantine and Tunis and the other cities of North Africa were full of the enemy. We switch you now to Washington for a special broadcast, the President's News Conference. Now to Washington. Start it there. On the air. This is Morgan Beatty in the White House in Washington. A few moments ago, the President held his first post-invasion press radio conference. President Roosevelt said that as of 12 o'clock today, American naval losses were two destroyers and one LST, that's landing ship tank. Losses relative to air landings were light, about 1%. He didn't say whether this meant personnel or ships involved. There were 181 reporters at the President's conference. Mr. Roosevelt said he felt the invasion was up to schedule. And, as Prime Minister Churchill would say, that is a mouthful. The President said that very few people here in Washington knew the timing of D-Day. You know, Mr. Roosevelt was alone among the high command the only one that had stayed up most of last night to follow the voluminous reports of invasion. He studied each dispatch behind the White House blackout blinds. They were pulled down, apparently, to avoid, to avoid even the rumors that a light in the White House at midnight last night might have started something. 
So when the chief executive faced the Washington press corps this afternoon, he was well abreast of the latest developments, but he gave us only an inkling of what these developments were. And anybody who asked any questions about them that he didn't think was proper, he promptly labeled improper. He said, however, that he was very happy and all the anonymous and silent people around him, he meant the White House staff that he works with every day, were all smiles today. He said he had little war news, but it was all right to cover the part about the losses. He said, as a matter of fact, that we newsmen were getting things as, as fast as people in the White House. The invasion was definitely up to schedule. Up to schedule. When he was asked uh, about how closely held was the secret of invasion, he said he didn't know. Uh, he said many people here in Washington and elsewhere knew that we were sending large forces over to the other side. But you could almost number the people on your fingers of your hand who on this side knew exactly when the date was going to be. The president was asked about when this date was set. What did he know about it in advance? And he said that he knew that the date would be approximately in May or in early June. As a matter of fact, he added, I knew last night as the boats loaded and started to cross. The date was chosen very largely, according to the president, because of the roughness of the English Channel. The weather factor was very important. He said that we needed what seamen call small boat weather to get people on the beaches in small boats. And then he was asked again if that was a major factor on the choice of the date, and he said definitely it was. Then he was wanted, some of the reporters wanted to know whether the invasion across the channel was timed to gear up with the fall of Rome. You know, Rome only fell yesterday. No, he said, because we didn't know when Rome would fall. But he did say that you can now see why we did not institute a second front when the politicians and others started clamoring for it. He said, we started planning for this thing, producing the arms in December of 1941, and today's action, or last night's, was the culmination of all that planning. He said that, obviously, the last six months gave us a tremendous chance to bring in many more divisions and landing craft. Uh, he was asked uh, about the parish radio, saying he was going to London the last of June, and he wanted to know if that was the summer or the spring. That was his uh, way of evading an answer. And here's a very important point he made just before the closing. He said, the thing we should be warned against at this moment is overconfidence. It's dangerous to the war effort. He said the war isn't over by any means, and this operation itself isn't over by any means. This is Morgan Beatty. I'm returning you now to the newsroom in New York from the White House in Washington. This is Don Hollenbeck in the NBC newsroom. A quick summary now of the events of the day. The Allied invasion is doing well. Secretary Stimson has just added his report to that news. German, mostly German reports say that we've made new landings. Enemy is busy making admissions, admissions that our troops are pouring ashore at many places along the Normandy coast. The new German report places the Allies in action directly across the strait from the cliffs of Dover. That would mean the invasion is spreading out over a wide area. These are all enemy reports, unconfirmed by our sources, and should be taken with caution. Shortly before this report, we heard Berlin tell of a fierce naval engagement between Calais and Dunkirk. The British radio says the Allied invasion line is now sufficiently broad to amount to more than just a beachhead. Of course, we know that additional landings are on the schedule. From the flow of statements from the Germans, these landings are being carried out. This is Don Hollenbeck in the NBC newsroom, and that's all for now. Also with us in the NBC newsroom is our good friend Don Goddard. Ladies and gentlemen, at 10 o'clock Eastern wartime tonight, President Roosevelt will go on the radio and will lead the nation in a prayer that he himself has composed in this poignant hour. The chief executive would like to have the people of the nation repeat with him the words of this supplication, whatever their creed, making with him a common prayer for a common cause. The National Broadcasting Company is presenting these words at this time, spoken at a speed that will enable you to set them down. After a two-minute interlude of music, which will enable you to procure pencil and paper, I will read the President's prayer, the prayer of the President of the United States, the prayer for the cause and the armies of the United Nations.
gentlemen, the prayer of the President of the United States. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness to their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. The enemy is strong. He may hurl back our forces. Success may not come with rushing speed, but we shall return again and again. And we know that by thy grace and by the righteousness of our cause, our sons will triumph. They will be sore tried by night and by day without rest till the victory is won. The darkness will be rent by noise and flame. Men's souls will be shaken with the violences of war. These are men lately drawn from the ways of peace. They fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They fight to let justice arise and tolerance and goodwill among all thy people. They yearn but for the end of battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father, and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. And for us at home, fathers, mothers, children, wives, sisters, and brothers of brave men overseas, whose thoughts and prayers are ever with them, help us, Almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in Thee in this hour of great sacrifice. Many people have urged that I call the nation into a single day of special prayer. But because the road is long and the desire is great, I ask that our people devote themselves in continuance of prayer. As we rise to each new day, and again, when each day is spent, let words of prayer be on our lips, invoking thy help to our efforts. Give us strength to, strength in our daily tasks to redouble the contributions we make in the physical and material support of our armed forces. And let our hearts be stout 
to wait out the long travail, to bear sorrows that may come, to impart our courage unto our sons, wheresoever they may be. And, O Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in Thee. Faith in our sons. Faith in each other. Faith in our united crusade. Let not the keenness of our spirit ever be dull. Let not the impacts of temporary events, of temporal matters, of but fleeting moment, let not these deter us in our unconquerable purpose. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Help us to conquer the apostles of greed and racial arrogances. Lead us to the saving of our country. And with our sister nations into a world unity that will spell sure peace. A peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men, and a peace that will let all men live in freedom, reaping the just rewards of their honest toil. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Amen. That is the prayer in which the President of the United States has asked us to join him as he leads us at 10 o'clock this evening over the radio. And now a few news bulletins that have just come in. A bulletin from London. The Nazi-operated Vichy Radio reported tonight that compact masses that's in quotation marks. Compact masses of Allied planes are bombing the Calais and Dunkirk regions of the French invasion coast. That's some 125 miles to the east of the landings made at Le Havre this morning. It means that our beachheads are expanding, that we are going to different portions of the coast. Dunkirk, of course, and Calais are nearest to the English coast. The German radio reports that Allied paratroopers have landed just across the channel from England, there in the Boulogne-Calais area. That those paratroopers have occupied an enemy airdrome there. If that is true, and there is no reason to believe the Germans would put out a false report of that nature, it means an Allied invasion thrust directly across the Strait of Dover, a hundred miles or more above that Allied beachhead area on the Norman coast. We have no confirmation of any invasion activity in this area from Allied headquarters as yet. But already we are expanding our beachhead there in Normandy. And in Stockholm they're saying that Denmark has said today that German troops in the protectorate there have been ordered on an invasion alert since early this morning. And General Sir Bernard Montgomery says he is pleased with the initial phases of the invasion operations. General Montgomery heads the Allied armies taking part in the landings, as you know. Montgomery was quite happy, as he told newsmen today, that he'd given his officers a five-point recipe for victory just before the invasion began. The five-point recipe for victory, Montgomery said, was this. One, allied solidarity. Two, offensive eagerness. Three, enthusiasm. Four, confidence. And five, all-out effort. That's General Montgomery's five-point recipe for victory. And in Washington, Secretary of War Stimson, with smiles on his face, told the newsmen that first reports of the allied landings in France indicated the long-awaited invasion was going very nicely. He's the second Washington official today to say that. Admiral King, chief of our navies, and a member of President Roosevelt's strategic board said that when he left the president this morning. And we learn now that the Nazis are suppressing news of the progress of the invasion and withholding the facts from the German people. Radio Atlantic, which is a German secret transmitter, charged in a broadcast monitored this afternoon by NBC 
that the German propaganda machine was letting only a trickle of news out to the German people. What scant news is put out by the German home radio is very confused and depressing, and the people of Berlin have gathered in the streets in whispering knots, wondering where the next blow will fall. They know that by nightfall and the hours of darkness now ensuing will mean more landings. Where, they ask. Their prime question is where. The clandestine transmitter located somewhere in Germany states all this today. It is significant, says this radio station, which is called anti-Nazi, that uh, though broadcasts beamed to Germany from England repeat the German claims of successes in naval engagements in the channel, the Reich radio has made no such statements. It has not claimed that Allied ships were sunk in the channel. The German radio... No, people know only too well the deplorable state of their fleet. They recall the sober statement of a high Nazi naval official that they are up against the strongest fleets in the world. And in Washington, Henri Opinot, the delegate of the French Committee of National Liberation, says that French divisions soon will participate in the Battle of France and that French shock troops will help to open the road to Paris, the road from Le Havre, we suppose. Side by side with American and British divisions, French divisions armed with the magnificent material given to them by the United States soon will participate in the battle. French soldiers will fight tomorrow as they have fought in Africa and in Italy, where by the side of the Allies they opened the road to Rome. Tomorrow they will open the road to Paris. And Prime Minister Winston Churchill received today this congratulatory message from Premier Stalin of Russia of the Allied liberation of Rome. He said, I congratulate you on the great victory of the Allied Anglo-American forces in the taking of Rome. This news has been greeted in the Soviet Union with great satisfaction. Those are the words of Premier Stalin. And the Berlin Radio reports tonight that big air battles have developed over Romania today between Nazi fighters and bombers of the Allied Mediterranean Air Force. Soon we may expect the Russians to be on the push there. This news is brought to you from the NBC Newsroom in New York by your commentator, Don Goddard. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Eastern Wartime, your station, WEAF, New York. NBC again asks you to pause in prayer on this historic invasion day. Dr. Douglas Horton, minister at large of the Congregational Christian Churches, will lead us. Dr. Horton. Let us pray. Almighty God, thou Lord of hosts, we humbly beseech thee for the men who on beach and in field on the air and on the sea, now cast themselves into the battle for the liberation of the peoples of Europe and of all the world. Be to them, we humbly pray, a strong defense against the known and the unknown dangers of the onslaught, the soldier's courage. Gird them with the armor of thine own spirit, for those who suffer, we humbly pray that thou wilt be the good physician. Thou hast known the wounds of hand and of side. Sustain all those who are in pain, O Lord, as one who understands can sustain. We commend unto thee all those who will, for our sakes, and freedom's sake, give up their lives. Grant to them the spirit of tranquility and trust. Give them to put their hope in thee. And having passed through the valley of the shadow in peace, we humbly pray that they may enter into the rest which thou hast promised. O God, Thou art the protector of all nations. Into thy hands we commit the keeping of our own nation. We commend to thy fatherly care the President of the United States and all those in authority abroad and give to us, O God, to do thy will as a nation 
And this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard a brief prayer by Dr. Douglas Horton, minister at large of the Congregational Christian Churches. The National Broadcasting Company regular programs so that all day and all night you'll be able to hear the latest news of the invasion as it happens. We're standing by now in the NBC newsroom. Any moment we'll get the communique from General Eisenhower's Allied headquarters somewhere in England, and also we expect to hear soon from our reporters in Washington. So now to continue our invasion program, we invite you to listen to the NBC Orchestra.
This is the NBC Newsroom in New York, ladies and gentlemen. And now for a report on the President's press conference, we take you to Morgan Beatty, the NBC Newsroom in Washington. This is Morgan Beatty in the NBC Newsroom in Washington. I've just returned here from the White House down the street, and I must say it's pretty hot in Washington today, and I'm just a little bit sleepy. As a matter of fact, the President's last question at his press conference was, Mr. President, how do you feel? Of course, the president's hair was neatly brushed, obviously, in reception of the press today, but he said, I'm pretty sleepy, because the president was the only man among the high command here in Washington who stayed up all last night to receive the reports as they came in from General Eisenhower's headquarters in London. And these reports, obviously, were very voluminous because of the detail the president was able to give us to do today. But first, let's review a few of the major points at his press conference and then go into detail. The president said that as of 12 o'clock today, his reports from General Eisenhower showed that American naval losses were two destroyers and one LST, that's landing ship tank, one of these medium uh, tank landing ships. The losses relative to air landing, he said, were light, about 1% of the forces involved. The president was asked in this connection whether or not 1% meant 1% of the men involved or 1% of the aircraft And he said he was sorry he couldn't go any further than that. As a matter of fact, there were quite a number of uh, questions at the conference today. The president smilingly, he was in a very good humor, the president smilingly characterized as entirely improper. And he said that the men who were asking them knew they were improper. As a matter of fact, they didn't think about whether they were improper. They were so curious to get at some of the secrecy and the things that have had to be secret in the past that might now be told. The president said that this much could be said. He felt the invasion was up to schedule as of this point. And as Prime Minister Churchill would say, that is a mouthful. And of course it is. The fact that we have achieved a a beachhead or several beachheads in France at a very relatively small cost is one of the most amazing developments of this very long and amazing war. The president said that very few people knew of the timing of D-Day. He said, of course, a lot of people knew that we had tremendous forces Uh, going over on the other side, uh, but that you could almost number the people on your hand in this country that knew exactly when D-Day was coming. Mr. Roosevelt opened his conference this afternoon by saying that he was very happy at his conference today. He said he and the anonymous and silent people all around him, that is the White House staff, the men that help him all the time, were all smiles. Then he said he had very little war news, but it was all right to cover the points that we've already given to you. Then one of the men asked the president how long he had known the date of invasion. And he was asked also whether or not it was geared to time up with the fall of Rome. The president said he had known the date of invasion, or the approximate date, that is, ever since the Tehran conference last December with Prime Minister Churchill and Joseph Stalin. And he said no, the invasion uh, of France was not time to gear up with the fall of Rome for the simple reason that we didn't know when Rome would fall. Then Mr. Roosevelt took occasion to go back and review the long preparations for this landing in France. He wanted to impress on us newsmen, very evidently, so that we would relay it to you that you just can't have a war and a great fight at the drop of a hat. He recalled that old story, you know, the speech of the politicians that in the days gone by, millions of men would spring to arms overnight in defense of America. He indicated that he thought that was a very pretty speech, but a lot of people, or a few people at least, always asked the question after a speech like that, well, where are you going to get the arms for these men to spring to overnight? And he said, you just can't do that sort of thing, especially in modern warfare. He said, we started planning this thing, we in America and in Britain, and producing arms, In December of 1940, he was referring to the joint war effort, of course, and particularly to the American effort. And he said that we have now selected the earliest possible date for the infliction of invasion on the enemy. He was asked then if the last six months had given us a chance to double the invasion force. The reporter that asked that apparently had been told or had the impression that we were given another six months on this thing because we could double our invasion force and be that much surer of the victory. But the president wouldn't quite agree with that point of view. He said he wouldn't say that, but obviously the last six months did give us a chance to bring in many more divisions and landing craft particularly. He said that 
As long ago as Tehran, he knew that the date would be approximately in May or early June. He said, I knew last night as the boats loaded and started to cross. As a matter of fact, you know, the president stayed up in his study or in his room in the White House behind the blackout. That was because, apparently, the White House didn't want anybody to get any suspicion or rumor started that there was a light up late in the White House in the president's rooms and probably something was up in connection with the war. So they had the blackout blinds drawn and the president poured over the reports coming in from General Eisenhower and all the other commanders and possibly from Prime Minister Churchill there in his White House room. He did that and he worked also on the prayer that he's been composing for several days, a prayer that he will give to the people himself, read to the people of the nation himself at 10 p.m. tonight. But to get back to that date, he said the date was chosen very largely because of the roughness of the English Channel early in the year. He said that we needed small boat weather. That's what seamen call weather good enough for very small craft to beach in. He said we needed small boat weather to get people on the beaches across the Channel. Then he was asked again, just to be sure on this point, whether weather was the major factor in the choice of the date for invasion And he said, definitely, yes. The president had one point he wanted to make to us toward the end of his conference. It was this. He warned us against overconfidence. He said that overconfidence was dangerous to the war effort. Then he told the story about a man he knew. You know, the president's fond of telling stories about men he knew. And some of the men think sometimes these men he know, uh, men he knew at various times, might be characters uh, sort of... uh, uh, montage, people sort of drawn out of his imagination, but nevertheless people who are very real somewhere. Anyway, he said something about a man he knew that came back from uh, Italy or Sicily after uh, the operations there with the impression that the war was all over. He said this man just threw up a good job and a very necessary job because he thought the war was all over and no further effort was necessary. Now, of course, you and I and lots of other people know people who did that very thing. I mean, the war charts, the charts on production in this country show very clearly that every time the Allies have a victory, a great number of people uh, do quit their job. This operation itself, meaning the invasion across the channel, this operation itself isn't over by any means. He says you just don't land and walk on through to Berlin at a moment's notice. And then was when the last question came in the conference, and how do you feel, Mr. President? All right, he said, but I'm a little bit sleepy. Mr. President, so am I. This is Morgan Beatty in Washington, returning you to New York. This is the NBC Newsroom in New York. And for a continuation of our invasion coverage, we take you now to Louis Lochner at NBC in Hollywood. From NBC's Hollywood Newsroom, here is Louis Lochner, Pulitzer Prize-winning European correspondent who knows more about Germans and Germany than any other American. Good afternoon. From Germany has come an item of news which, if borne out by subsequent developments, may have far greater significance than first meets the eye. It was reported last night that the great intuition corporal, Adolf Hitler himself, had moved his Führerhauptquartier, in other words, his GHQ, to Western Europe and had taken personal charge of the defense of the continent against the United Nations invasion. Of late, Adolf Hitler seemed to have been superseded by the old line general staff. More than that, Field Marshal General von Brunstedt, a holdover from the Imperial General Staff of World War I, was reported as placed ahead of the typical Nazi generals, especially Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, and was placed in supreme charge of the invasion area. If now Adolf Hitler has been put ahead of von Brunstedt, I cannot escape the conclusion that this is evidence that the general staff, now as in 1918, sees far earlier than did the, do the political leaders that the war is lost. Let me reveal a story today that, as far as I know, has not been told in this country. It is vouched for by one of my best and most trusted friends. This friend of mine knew well a former lady-in-waiting to the late German Empress Victoria Louise, first wife of the deceased Kaiser Wilhelm II. Those of you whose memories go back far enough to recall some details of World War I will recall that during the first part 
of our struggle to make the world safe for democracy, the Kaiser was comparatively little heard of, at least comparatively little as regards managing the war. Publicity was spotlighted upon Field Marshal von Hindenburg, and especially upon that supposed super genius of strategy, General Erich Ludendorff. It was Ludendorff here and Ludendorff there. And as a symbol of Germany's will to win, General von Hindenburg was made just as popular as the propaganda facilities of that period permitted. For instance, a huge wooden, super-life-sized statue of Hindenburg was placed on a prominent square, and anybody who contributed, I believe it was one mark, toward the German war chest, was permitted to hammer one iron nail into the statue. It was not long before the enormous statue no longer seemed to be of wood, but of iron, and was therefore dubbed der Eiserne Hindenburg, the Iron Hindenburg. When things began to go very badly for the Imperial German Army, however, the announcement was made one day that the Kaiser had taken over supreme command. Now then, the interesting revelation that this lady-in-waiting made to my friend was that in the bosom of the family, where only a few members were present, the Kaiser said to his wife and to such of his children as may have been there, such as the princess, I am going to be the scapegoat in this war. The general staff knows that the war is last, lost. And so it has decided that I must take the responsibility and head the armed forces. As sovereign of my people, I cannot shift responsibility. If a call of this kind comes to me, I must accept it. But I know that this is one way in which the general staff wishes to escape the responsibility for defeat. Now, if these words are, as I take them to be, true, that the Kaiser said them on that evening, there are certain very interesting conclusions we can draw about the coming events in Germany. Even if, at the present time, the rumor should not prove correct that Hitler has taken supreme command... It will be interesting to watch and see when that moment arrives. And then you can be sure that the general staff will try a repetition of what happened at the end of the last world war. Ludendorff was able to escape to Sweden. And just as soon as the young struggling republic got into difficulties and the Republican regime which followed the Imperial had to clean up a mess, General, von Ruden, General Ludendorff reappeared and became the backbone of the movement that finally built up Hitler and that is really responsible for bringing about the present war. So in conclusion, I would say, whether now or at a later time, Adolf Hitler assumes final responsibility. That is the moment when you can be sure that the general staff knows the war is lost and is putting in a scapegoat. You've been listening to Louis P. Lochner speaking from our newsroom in Hollywood. We return you now to NBC Newsroom in New York. Back in the NBC Newsroom in New York... We now bring you some bulletins that have just been handed us here. London. Four heavy bombers and seven fighters were missing from three United States 8th Air Force heavy bomber missions against more than 100 targets in German coastal defenses today. This was announced tonight. A bulletin here from New York. The main transmitters of the Nazi DNB propaganda agency in Berlin went off the air for 48 minutes tonight without explanation, FCC monitors reported. The main transmitters of the Nazi DNB propaganda agency in Berlin went off the air for 48 minutes tonight without explanation. From Italy, this development. 
Crown Prince Umberto, newly designated Lieutenant General of Italy, today instructed Marshal Pietro Bodoglio to form a new government to include the political leaders now in Rome. Bodoglio received this commission after having tendered his pro forma resignation to Umberto. The government now in exercise will continue its functions in its present form until the new cabinet has been constituted. It was understood in Naples today that Bodoglio and several ministers will go to Rome in the very near future in order to consult there with the erstwhile underground leaders, most of whom are unknown to the Italian public regarding the formation of a new cabinet. And meanwhile, the official seat of the Italian, uh, Italian government will remain at Salerno inasmuch as the present military exigencies will not permit Rome to be placed under Italian jurisdiction. Bodoglio sent messages of thanks for the liberation of Rome to Mr. Roosevelt, Mr. Churchill, and Mr. Stalin. He told Stalin that the Italian people know the heroic defenders of Stalingrad were present in spirit at the liberation of Rome. Keep tuned to this NBC station at 5.30 Eastern Time in just a few minutes. NBC expects to bring you an important broadcast from London. Here are additional bulletins. More news of how Moscow and all Russia reacted to the news of the Western Front. Word spread through Russia like a wind-whipped fire today that Anglo-American armies had landed in France and the people exploded with a spontaneous joy seldom even accorded their own great victories. The news came as Soviet armies themselves were poised to strike along a 2,000-mile front in fulfillment of the combined offensive from east, west, and south worked out at the Tehran conference. Instantly, the Soviets voiced a conviction that their Western allies would smash the Germans in record time. The swift capture of Rome convinced people here that the Allied armies carry a terrific punch. They expressed also a hope that the war will now be ended quickly. American correspondents were the first to announce the news to the Russians. It was not until later, at 1.45 p.m., that the Moscow radio quoted the number one Allied communique. Another bulletin just in. Tokyo held an emergency air raid drill today. The Japanese official news agency declared Tokyo held an emergency air raid drill today. The explanation of the enemy action usually taken only when Allied bombers are on the way came later. And here's some late news on the... Uh, Relief supplies for United States prisoners in Japan. The Soviet government has agreed to permit a Japanese ship to enter a specified Russian port near Vladivostok to pick up relief supplies for American prisoners in the Orient. In making this announcement today, the State Department at Washington says that stocks of supplies sent to Russia last year have been awaiting transportation. And another bulletin, Calcutta. Strong formations of Allied heavy bombers have given the Thailand capital of Bangkok its heaviest pounding of the war yesterday. This is the National Broadcasting Company. W-E-A-F, New York. Just one moment, please, ladies and gentlemen. Stand by. We're expecting another special bulletin or a special broadcast in just a moment. We've just been advised to stand by for a broadcast from London that is apt to occur at most any moment. In the meantime, here in the NBC newsroom in New York, additional bulletins. Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force, June 6th. The American 9th Air Force flew more than 2,500 individual missions before 1 p.m. today. This was in the most violent 12 hours of aerial warfare in history, official spokesman announced tonight. And here's how the Moscow home radio broadcast the invasion news. 
British, American, and Canadian troops have landed this morning in France. The liberating forces are advancing and no obstacle can halt them. The task before us is not easy. And no, the operation of transporting large armies over a changeable sea and their landing on a coast guarded by the enemy are the most complicated of all tasks known to military science. At the present time, our men are landing on a coast along which the enemy has created the most powerful defense zone that he could construct during four years of occupation. Our troops are already being subjected to counterattacks by specially trained enemy divisions that he has concentrated against us in France. This has been a day of momentous news, and not the least of the spectacular reports we have broadcast from here, the NBC newsroom in New York, was the eyewitness account of our Stanley Richardson, the first reporter to bring back a first-hand report from one of the naval ships which took part in the invasion. His report was first broadcast early this morning. Now, for the benefit of NBC's listeners, we bring you a transcription of this historic broadcast by Stanley Richardson. People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe, made in conjunction with our great Russian allies. I have this message for all of you. Although the initial assault may not have been made in your own country, the power of your liberation is approaching. All patriots, men and women, young and old, have a part to play in the achievement of final victory. To members of resistance movements, whether led by nationals or by outside leaders, I say, follow the instructions you have received. To patriots who are not members of organized resistance groups, they'll say, continue your healthy resistance, but do not needlessly endanger your lives. Wait until I give you the signal to rise and strike the enemy. The day will come when I shall need your united strength. Until that day, I call on you for the hard task of discipline and restraint. Citizens of France, I am proud to have again under my command the gallant forces of France. Fighting with one of their allies, they will play a worthy part in the liberation of their homeland. Because the initial landing has been made on the soil of your country, I will speak to you with even greater emphasis my message to the peoples of other occupied countries in Western Europe. Follow the instructions of your leaders. A premature uprising of all Frenchmen may prevent you from being of maximum help to your countries in a critical hour. Be patient. Prepare. As Supreme Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force, there is imposed on me the duty and responsibility of taking all measures necessary to the prosecution of the war. Prompt and willing obedience to the orders that I shall issue is essential. Effective civil administration of France must be provided by Frenchmen. All persons must control in their present duties unless otherwise instructed. Those who have made common cause with the enemy and so betrayed their country will be removed. When France is liberated from her oppressors, you yourselves will choose your representatives and the government under which you wish to live. In the course of this campaign for the final defeat of the enemy, you may sustain further loss and damage. Tragic though they may be, they are part of the price of victory. I assure you that I shall do all in my power to mitigate your hardship. I know that I can count on your steadfastness now, no less than in the past. For the heroic deeds of Frenchmen who have continued the struggle against the Nazis and their vision satellites in France and throughout the French Empire have been an example and an inspiration to all of us. This landing is the European phase of the campaign in Western Europe. Great battles lie ahead. I call upon all who love freedom to stand with us now. Keep your faith staunch. Our arms are resolute. Together we shall achieve victory. You have just heard the Supreme Commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower. 
it has just been announced that General de Gaulle has arrived in England. He will broadcast a message to the people of France later in the day. Back in the NBC newsroom in New York, and ladies and gentlemen, as we announced an error that it was NBC's Stanley Richardson who was about to broadcast to you. Of course, as you know, it was General Eisenhower's historic message to the peoples of occupied Europe. Stanley Richardson is a good man, too. Great credit to Richardson and his staff for helping us out in these moments. And now here in the newsroom beside me the microphone is NBC's Elmer Peterson. We'll take over for a moment. We're waiting now, and we should receive it very shortly for another communique from Allied headquarters somewhere in England. These communiques, these official communiques, as you know, are worded very carefully. And so far, you, have, you will have noted, there has been great caution in the wording of these communiques by the Allied leaders. Every effort is made to be sure that the communiques are exact, that the communiques avoid any over-optimism. And so far, there has been, in, in our own communiques, there has been nothing of the detail that we have received from sources in Germany and in neutral countries. Allied headquarters in Britain, Allied headquarters in Britain at this time, of course, is a very busy organization. It's composed of staff officers. Somewhere General Eisenhower is watching every development. Somewhere he's in constant touch with those, those exciting developments across the English Channel. And from these reports, brought back in every conceivable manner, brought back by plane, by courier, brought back by shortwave, the actual wording of the communiques evolved. This communique, which we should receive very shortly, should, of course, give us a better idea of just how far we have advanced. It should give us a better idea of how much progress we have made, and it certainly will give us something to use in balancing the Allied version of the fighting against the version we are receiving from Germany. For this must be remembered. The Germans have a certain propaganda value in the reports they're putting out about the fighting. Fundamentally, the Germans are sitting back, in a certain respect, waiting to see just what the invasion is going to develop into. They have to watch to see just where the main thrust is going to come. Because, fundamentally, they must, be, they must attack hard at the point where the pressure is going to be greatest. And so far... There has been no indication that this landing on the Normandy coast is the main thrust. We may develop another offensive far larger. We may develop other diversionary offensives. Here we're getting a test of what Churchill once promised us, namely that we must expect feints and false thrusts and rehearsals. So the Germans in their, in their communiques and their pronouncements are trying to create the impression, of course, that fundamentally the Allies are advancing here and there. They're trying to create a certain impression which the Allied communique, shortly to be received, is going to correct. It's important that we should watch these Allied communiques and take them literally. It's important that when it comes to a final judgment of what's going on, we should base our impressions on the official Allied communiques as received. And if we accept, if we pay attention to the reports from neutral countries and from Germany, they must always be accepted with a certain amount of caution. And here's some news just arrived from London. It's probable that Prime Minister Churchill will give an almost day-to-day -day account in the House of Commons on the fortunes of the Western Front following his two appearances today. We've always known that Prime Minister Churchill likes playing, likes playing reporter. He's always enjoyed a certain dramatic touch about his announcements. And certainly the British Prime Minister must, must like his present role of, of informing the world in the House of Commons on day-to-day -day developments. The Berlin Radio has reported tonight that big air battles have developed over Romania today between Nazi fighters and bombers of the Allied Mediterranean Air Force. It's a significant report because, after all, we're still waiting to see what the Red Armies intend to do. Those Red Armies have been preparing for many months, for many weeks now. The Germans have been a counterattacking north of Yassi in Romania, Obviously because, obviously, because they expect an offensive in that direction. And then we've had the report of the new shuttle bombing program using Russian, using airfields in Russia. 
Altogether, it indicates that some action can be expected from Russia very shortly. And the speculation in London is that within 24 to 48 hours, and certainly before this week is over, the Red Army will be taking its full share of the final attack. And here's the late news from the Russian war front. Large forces of German infantry and tanks today again launched a series of futile counterattacks against Russian troops north and northwest of this Romanian rail hub of Yasi. All the assaults were beaten back, the Red Army High Command announced, with the Nazis losing at least 49 tanks and 42 planes. And while we're watching developments in France and in the Southeast Europe, it's also well to keep an eye on North Europe. We have, the, we have the Nazis encircled now on three sides, but there's still a fourth side. And the Nazis have been feeling out in this direction. They've been making predictions that the Russians may even go so far as to attack across North Finland into North Norway. And this is not without likelihood. After all, the Arctic route has been cleared. Our convoys are now sailing directly to Murmansk without interference. We've demonstrated that we have a certain amount of air superiority over North Norway, over North Europe, and this may lead to developments which will eventually see Germany being attacked from all sides in Europe instead of only three sides. A late Berlin broadcast admits that a strong formation of glider-borne allied paratroops have succeeded in gaining a foothold on both sides of the road from Carentan to Valone, south of the great French port of Cherbourg. The broadcast said this force has received reinforcements during the morning and at noon. Already, the parachute troops of the Allies have made an impressive result. But we must expect them also, before the invasion is over, to penetrate deeper and deeper into Allied territory. Thank you, Elmer Peterson. Ladies and gentlemen, we're still standing by for this Allied communique direct from London. In the meantime, continuing our invasion coverage, our invasion program, we invite you to listen to the NBC Orchestra.
heard a musical interlude in our invasion program by the NBC Orchestra. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Continuing its special worldwide coverage of the invasion on D-Day, CBS World News now presents Quincy Howe with up-to-the-minute developments. Mr. Howe. Instead of repeating more recent scattered bulletins, it seems a good idea at this point to insert in today's broadcast a summary of the main events of the past 18 hours. Shortly before midnight, the German radio announced, This is D-Day, and spoke of allied parachutists landing in France. Three hours later came the first official announcement from Supreme Allied Headquarters in Britain. It stated that the invasion had begun with heavy sea and air bombardment. Meanwhile, the underground resistance movement had been addressed by various exiled leaders speaking over the shortwave radio from Britain. And General Eisenhower's headquarters told the inhabitants of the French coast that the air attacks on that region were entering a new phase. From then on, events moved rapidly and the real news began to come in. Prime Minister Churchill told the House of Commons that the crossing by sea had proved less difficult than had been expected. The fire of the German shore batteries was quickly quelled. Then came massed airborne landings, the largest in history. Everything was proceeding according to a plan, Churchill declared, and added, and what a plan. He thought we might have achieved tactical, that means sort of local, surprise. Britain's General Montgomery commanded the first invasion troops who included British, Canadian, and Americans. And the day before D-Day, he predicted that the Germans would take their, or would make, rather, their strongest fight right on the beachheads themselves. But things went so well at the beachhead that it now seems likely that the Germans are saving their big punch to later. In fact, a bulletin came in a few minutes ago from Supreme Allied Headquarters saying that the first German counterattack in France is likely to materialize within the next 48 hours. That's what informed headquarters there say. But the first report said little about the location. Of, the, of these landings, At, in a, until in a second appearance before the House of Commons, Mr. Churchill announced that the city of Caen, that's spelled C-A-E-N, at the eastern end of the peninsula of Normandy, was being attacked by glider and parachute troops. Later, our ground forces penetrated nine and a half miles inland in this area to fight in the streets of Caen itself. Churchill disclosed that the Allies had put 11,000 planes into the air and 4,000 naval vessels onto the sea. British warships in this armada poured shells into the area near the port of Le Havre at a rate of 2,000 tons in 10 minutes. Royal Air Force planes carried the brunt of the night fighting. Then the Americans took over at daylight, and between them, that is, between the Americans and the British, they provided steady cover for the ships and landing parties. The Germans put only 50 planes into the air, and this after Marshal Goering, the head of the German Air Force, had said the invasion must be stopped even if it means the death of the Luftwaffe. By this time, it had become clear that the main weight of our first attack was being directed against the peninsula of Normandy, which juts out northward from the northern coast of France into the English Channel. Further to the west lies the larger peninsula of Brittany, which marks the entrance of the English Channel. The purpose of this first attack seems to be to pinch off the whole Norman peninsula. At the tip of this peninsula lies the big port of Cherbourg. We may also be aiming to take Le Havre, which lies a few miles northeast of Caen on another small peninsula that juts out beyond the mouth of the River Seine. The Seine empties into the sea between Caen and Le Havre and flows through Paris a couple of hundred miles inland. Prime Minister Churchill not only kept right on scooping the world with his bulletins of allied progress, he acted as his own commentator. He said the Allies had accomplished their first successes with extremely light losses. He singled out the airborne troops, many of them Americans, for especially high praise. He then predicted much heavier blows by both sides. He warned that the Germans will rush troops to the regions under attack, but he also let it be known that the Allied armies have new weapons, new tactics, everything in short that equipment, science, and forethought can do to make this great offensive a success. Mr. Churchill lived up to his character, his reputation, and his position as the king's first minister. He therefore left it to the king, King George VI, as the head of the British state, to strike a more solemn religious note in a measured broadcast delivered to the world three hours ago. The king spoke with difficulty and deep feeling. He called for earnest and continuous and widespread prayer throughout the present crisis of the liberation of Europe. 
We are not unmindful of our shortcomings of the past and present, said King George. We shall not ask that God may do our will, but that we may be enabled to do the will of God. And we dare to believe that God has used our nation and empire as an instrument for fulfilling his high purpose. President Roosevelt, who's the head of our state, as King George is the head of the British state, also urged his people to have recourse to prayer. In fact, as soon as the president finished his broadcast on the fall of Rome last night, he composed a prayer of his own, which he will deliver over all the major networks this evening at 10 p.m. Eastern wartime, four hours from now, and he, which he asked us all to join him in offering up. He prayed to God to lead our soldiers straight and true. He also prayed for u world unity that will spell a sure peace, a peace invulnerable to the schemings of unworthy men. The Russians, of course, don't go in for prayer quite so much as the British and Americans do. But none of their own victories cause more joy than today's news. This is what the Russians have been waiting for during almost three years of the most devastating war any country has ever suffered. They now feel that the Anglo-American armies really are in there, fighting the same enemy. They see hopes of early victory. They expect their own armies to start moving westward against the Germans any time now. But the military aspect of our attack from the West, important as they are, are not the only reason for the exaltation of the Russian people. For the past quarter century and more, the Russians have felt themselves cut off from the rest of the world. Their leaders have told them that the rest of the world wanted to wipe out their regime and undo the achievements of their revolution. The Russians had plenty of reason to distrust the outside world in the early years of their revolution. But as they built up their country, they began to become more curious about the outside world. They began to encourage visitors, though they never encouraged their own people to emigrate, and their regime ex exercised a dictatorial control over their daily lives. Then came the war. The Hitler-Stalin pact isolated Russia from the West. The German attack then threatened to destroy them utterly. But their own power and the increased help they got from Britain and the United States pulled them through. Now they see the Western allies putting on an offensive that matches some of their own efforts against the common enemy. They also hear leaders in Britain and America, men who used to fear and hate Russian communism, praising their country and calling for cooperation between the Soviet Union and the rest of the world. Today, on the beaches of northern France, the Russians therefore see a new period in their history beginning, a period in which they will play a larger part with other nations. The fact of Russia never meant more to us in the United States than it does today, because only today have the Russians received the final proof they have been looking for all these years that we are with them in the war and in the peace. And a bulletin just handed me from Reuters, the British news agency says, scores of United States heavily, heavy bombers, heavily escorted by fighters, took off from an American base in Russia and roared over the Soviet German front to shower many tons of high explosive and incendiary bombs on airdrome installations at Galat in the first American raid of the war from the new shuttle bases in Russian territory. We're still awaiting a live communique number two, and we'll switch to London for it as soon as word comes in that it's ready, so there may be a sudden interruption in this program at any point. Well, for the Russians, the final results of today's landings can mean only better tidings. For the French, the future is not so clear and not so certain. While Frenchmen in Algiers embraced one another on the street and wept for joy, feeble old Marshal Pétain tottered up to a German microphone in Paris and urged his people to refrain from action, which would call, upon, call down upon you tragic reprisals. France has become a battlefield, he continued. The circumstances of battle may compel the German army to take special measures in the area. And here's the bulletin, Supreme Allied e Expeditionary Force. Wednesday, June 7, Allied forces succeeded in their initial landings and fighting continues, said Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force today. This report is still coming in. There'll be more in a few minutes. Marshal Pétain, getting back to his speech again, told all workers in France to remain at their posts. Do not listen to outside voices, he warned, calling on you not to listen to our decree. But shortly after the voice of Pétain had spoken these words, a British broadcasting station put on General de Gaulle, who's just arrived in London. General de Gaulle urged the French people to fight with all the means at their disposal. The supreme battle has begun, he said. This is the decisive blow which we have so much hoped for. This is the battle of France and France's battle. He called on all the sons of France to fight with all the means at their disposal. He also told the people of France to follow exactly the orders given by his government. It's hard to exaggerate the tragedy of General de Gaulle's present position, indeed the present position of France. 
He and his followers must not only fight the Germans, they must fight the apathy and suspicion of some of their own people. And they must fight the doubts and hesitations of some of our leaders who have withheld full diplomatic uh, recognition right up to the very end. Perhaps our authorities have acted wisely in withholding this full dem diplomatic recognition that the goal has been demanding for more than a year. But if the strongest leader in the French resistance movement does not deserve more than partial recognition, then that resistance movement is weak indeed. And if the French committee does deserve better of us, if de Gaulle is able to rally the French people, those people will always reproach us because we did not do more to help them in their hour of need. And then again getting back to this communique in its second communique on the invasion, Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces said that the Allied assault forces met little opposition in the channel or in the air. And here's communique number three, also from SHAEF. Light, heavy, and medium allied bombers continued their air bombardment in very great strength throughout the day with attacks on gun emplacements, defensive works, and communications. And here is communique four just in. Continuous fighter cover was maintained over the beaches and for some distance inland and over naval operations in the channel. That also was included in the communique. These landings in Western Europe overshadow, of course, the fighting north of Rome. But today's dispatches from the Italian capital report good progress on that front, too. American troops have moved ahead five miles beyond the Tiber River. Troops from French Morocco have captured Tivoli Junction 16 miles east of Rome. And British troops at the western end of the front, bound by the mouth of the Tiber, have taken 2,000 more German prisoners. Yesterday, our troops beyond Rome met with no enemy opposition at all. The Germans were retreating too fast. Today, they defeated German rear guards in fierce tank fighting, and from then on, the opposition again weakened. The Germans quit Rome so fast, they left 11 of the 14 main bridges across the Tiber River intact. Our Mediterranean air forces flew 2,400 sorties yesterday, most of them against rail yards and bridges in northern Italy. And from Naples comes the news that Marshal Badoglio has dissolved his present all-party government, and that Crown Prince Umberto, who's taken on his father's job as king, has asked Badoglio to form a new government. The king is dead, long live the king. Or to quote another French proverb, the more it changes, the more it's the same thing. And now for some more bulletins and dispatches that have come in during the past hour or two. This afternoon, President Roosevelt told his White House news conference that the invasion of Europe is up to schedule. Up to noon, Eastern wartime today, Mr. Roosevelt told his news conference that American naval losses in the invasion consisted of two destroyers and one LST landing craft. Total air losses were 1%, a figure the president described as relatively light. There were more than 150 newsmen jammed into the big Oval Office for the first presidential conference since the invasion. Mr. Roosevelt was in shirt sleeves and smiling. He said he thought it was going to be a very happy conference. But he did say the country, uh, he said the country had full reason to be thrilled, but he hoped this would not lead to overconfidence, which would destroy the war effort. And Prime Minister Churchill has received today this congratulatory message from Premier Stalin of Russia on the liberation of Rome. I congratulate you on the great victory of the allied Anglo-American forces in the taking of Rome. This news has been greeted in the Soviet Union with great satisfaction. And I'm repeating again the late uh, communique that's just come in from Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Forces. Allied forces succeeded in their initial landings and fighting continued. In its second communique of the invasion, SHAEF said that the Allied assault forces met little opposition in the channel or on the air. And Radio Berlin reported big air battles over Romania, while the daily Soviet communique said the Red Army had repulsed continuing Nazi attacks north and northeast of Yassi in Romania, and that Russian bombers had carried out a mass raid on Yassi itself. You've just heard CBS analyst Quincy Hell with up-to-the-minute developments of the Allied Invasion on D-Day, brought to you by CBS World News. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Edwin C. Hill with the human side of the news. Presented by Johnson & Johnson, maker of Band-Aid, a ready-made adhesive bandage that helps keep little injuries little. Friends, this Tuesday, because of the special interest in war news, Band-Aid is giving up its commercial time so that Mr. Hill can give you the fullest possible report of the developments overseas. And you can be sure that if any news flashes come into the CBS newsroom during this broadcast, they will be passed on to you immediately. And now Band-Aid presents 
the famous American journalist, Edwin C. Hill. Good evening, everyone. The most colossal military enterprise in all history is well underway, with the German defenses along the French coast for a distance of more than 100 miles found to be much weaker than our military leaders had feared, and with our losses much smaller than had been feared. It is possible, even probable, that in the next uh, few minutes, perhaps most any time, a most important communique will be received here from General Eisenhower himself. If that is true, it will instantly be put before you. Although more than 4,000 ships moved steadily to the coast of Normandy under the protection of 11,000 bombing and fighting planes, the cost in killed and wounded were described by none other than General Eisenhower as very, very small. It cannot be expected that such good tidings can be long continued. Our troops and the troops of our British allies drawn from almost every part of the great British Commonwealth of Nations must soon engage if they have not already done so in the heaviest fighting. The German radio asserts that von Rundstedt, their supreme commander and a soldier of undoubted skill, is bringing up every reinforcement to the coast where, said the Germans, a battle for life or death is even now in progress. Just why initial resistance by the Germans was so unexpectedly weak along that stretch of coast from Cherbourg to Le Havre around the estuary of the Seine River on the northeast shore of the peninsula of Normandy seemed to be something of a surprise and a puzzle to our commanders. The Germans were known to have probably 1,750 fighters and at least 500 bombers to meet the attack, to smash at our invasion fleet, and at the men coming ashore on every beach. But it is not forgotten that Air Marshal Goring told his air forces in an order of the day that the invasion must be beaten off, even if the Luftwaffe perished. Notwithstanding Goring's lethal orders, the German Air Force failed to put up anything in the nature of effective opposition. <coughs> Perhaps the reason is apparent in the overwhelming <coughs> strength of the invasion forces and in the brilliancy of planning by our generals and admirals. <coughs> More than 640 naval guns, ranging from 4 to 16 inch, hurled many tons of shells accurately into the coastal fortifications on which the Germans had spent four years preparing against this day. Prime Minister Church was able to tell Parliament that the shore batteries had been largely quelled the underwater obstructions had proven less dangerous than feared, and the whole operation was proceeding according to plan. It was General Sir Bernard L. Montgomery who led the seaborne troops, the American and the British, magnificently, as always he has led them, from the deserts of Africa to the fair land of France. Airborne troops, parachutes, and glider men who went in after personal farewells from General Eisenhower played a brilliant part in the invasion picture. The Germans say they landed at Cannes, and made a deep penetration at many points. It is most interesting to recall that it was from Cannes and from the Dives sur mer region of coast near Deauville that William of Normandy launched his invasion of Saxon England in the year 1066. And now history, reversing, not repeating herself, sends the sons of Saxon and Norman English and of fighting Irish and other good breeds in whose veins the blood of courage and love of liberty has never ceased to flow sends them back to that very land, almost to that very port from which they came those long years ago. It is, of course, much too soon to gather from the whole invasion picture more than a few scattered glimpses. But the scene, the panorama of the invasion, stretching along the sea coast for more than 100 miles, must have been an appallingly magnificent spectacle could any human eye have envisioned its sweep and surge or any human ear caught the happy re repercussions of the great and little gun. 4,000 shiploads of soldiers. Nobody knows yet how many, although 4,000 ships could easily have carried half a million men to the coast of Normandy. 4,000 men, ships from 4,000 men scrambling into the surf, wading ashore, surging up onto the beaches, ready for action, going instantly into battle. Warships of the British and United States Navy standing out at sea, hurling thousands of tons of shells into the coastal defenses upon which the Germans had put four years of effort countless billions in their money, and which they thought to be impregnable. The Germans themselves said that the whole Bay of the Seine was a fire. If the German land troops, who must have been in great force, retreated slowly, it is difficult to believe that they could have escaped terrific losses. The English Channel skies were black with Allied warcraft, heavy and medium bombers, fighters, fighter bombers, rocket bombers, tow planes, gliders, supply and hospital craft, and possibly aerial tank carriers. Not too late was too little this time. No wonder that Mr. Churchill exclaimed to a cheering House of Commons, what a plan, what a plan. No wonder that General Montgomery, commander of all land forces, said to his troops, we have absolute and complete confidence in the outcome. No wonder that General Eisenhower, 
the man with the greatest responsibility that has been borne by any military figure since Washington, declared with great assurance in his final order of the day, we will accept nothing less than complete victory. A negotiated peace is not for such men as Montgomery and Eisenhower. They know the people they're up against. These men and our president, too, have said in so many words that Germany has been an incessant war maker for a thousand years and must be reduced to military impotence and held there. They know that the Nazis and Japanese are fighting to enslave the world. They know that we are fighting to free the slaves of the Nazis and the Japanese and to preserve our liberty. Free men can always win over military might when they're not disarmed or divided. If that were not true, the Allied forces could not have driven the Nazi hordes thousands of miles across the African desert, across the Mediterranean, and over the mountains of southern Italy. If that were not true, the retreating of German divisions would not still be running north of Rome. But as the Gustav line was not broken quickly or easily, so we must be prepared for reverses and sacrifices on the much stronger Western line before the final breakthrough. Now that the battle has begun, there's little enough that we here at home can do for our beloved ones in the thick of it all. All our war work, however essential, seems so small compared with what they are giving. Our prayers go with them this day and every day until the victorious end. God bless them and guide them and keep them. God make us worthy of them. Never in all history has so much been at stake as in the battles which are now occurring and the battles that will occur. Four years from the day the Germans broke the Maginot Line at Sedan, less than 48 hours after the redemption of Rome, each hour of D-Day came, the moment so long awaited by the world's democracy. As a pure and simple military undertaking, the invasion was stupendous in its magnitude. As a controlling factor in the destinies of the world for generations to come, it was a stroke for which the future may never find a parallel. For upon its outcome depends the deliverance of the world from Nazi tyranny. And already, only a few hours after the opening gun was fired, there are, as I've said, indications of success in the initial phases, at least, of the greatest armed operation in all history. And as I told you at the beginning, at any moment may come a greater bulletin from General Eisenhower with a promise, I think, of even more success. And here is bulletin number two at this very moment from Supreme Headquarters Allied Ex Expeditionary Force from Eisenhower himself. Allied forces have succeeded in their initial landings in France and the fighting continues. And then the bulletin goes on to say that naval casualties are regarded as very light. Allied planes continue the air bombardment in very great strength throughout the day. It is with a prayer for God's support upon his lips, an unshakable conviction of ultimate triumph in his heart, that General Dwight D. Eisenhower gave the signal for attack in the early hours of this morning. The invasion of Europe began swiftly, almost silently. Advanced parties of assault troops marched into the landing stages of the English ports, slammed aboard the blunt-nosed assault craft, and then transhipped to the larger craft, swing at anchor farther out in the harbor. They said goodbye to English soil for a long time. Gangs of service troops loaded the rations that will sustain the task force while seaborne between England and the European continent. It was said there were enough rations put aboard to last eight days plus one day of emergency combat rations. The prologue to the invasion was carried on by highly trained Army and Navy personnel and almost under the noses of the English civilian populace without attracting the slightest bit of attention. Indeed, the public had been thoroughly conditioned by many practiced embarkations and landings. Those who saw the small advance parties with the light combat packs march to the takeoff points were not able to say that this was it. But the troops knew. They knew that the hour had come this time for sure. This was it. Assault troops of combat divisions moved into the assembly area. Landing craft of all types began assembling close to shore. Day before yesterday, the assembly areas were changed into marshalling areas. And this meant that the troops, having been briefed at this exact mission, were reshuffled into craft loads. Yes, the invasion is on, and although the news is reassuring from the invasion coast, we feel as if iron hands were gripping our hearts. Here in New York as in all America, as wherever lovers of human freedom await news with such intensity as very probably humankind never before experienced, this day has been a day of prayer, prayer for victory, and prayer that the toll of young life may be, by God's mercy, not too great. In homes, churches, synagogues, and schools, millions gathered humbly to entreat divine aid. The solemn mood is well expressed for the leading editorial of the New York Sun. 
Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Thus spake the Son of Man, who is also the Son of God, as he prepared to enter upon the last mile that led to Calvary and the cross. And thus today must all of us speak, those who at home suffer vicariously, and those who in the full glory of superb manhood advance toward the grand climax of all their training and preparation. Here it is. This is what we're all here for. Life and strength, youth and wisdom, courage and sacrifice, health and fortune, all we have our hope for our children's children to have is staked upon the adventure of this day. Let us humbly and prayerfully hope that the event may justify our highest expectations. Insofar as the human element is concerned, we need have no doubt of the outcome. They are bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, blood of our blood to carry on this enterprise, and they will not fail. Insofar as technical preparation is involved, we have every right to repose the utmost confidence in our military and naval experts, who for months have been working out the plan. As for the justice of our cause, we have no occasion to fear any judgment, human or divine. We have no right to ask, no right to expect an immediate and overwhelming conquest over our resourceful and well-fortified foe. We nevertheless do believe that the best cause will win because the best men are fighting for it. That cause is our cause. Those men are our men. The distinguished prelate resides over the Archdiocese of New York, penned the most eloquent and moving supplication to the creator of all things, as did the right Reverend Henry St. George Tucker, presiding bishop of the Protestant Episcopal Church and president of the Federal Council of Churches of Christ in America. None of the prayers winging heavenward in these hours of tremendous need for God's aid said more in little than that breathed by Dr. Tucker. Almighty and most merciful God, he prayed, Father of all mankind, Lover of every life, here we beseech thee the cry of thy children in this dark hour of conflict and danger. Thou hast been the refuge and strength in all generations of those who put their trust in thee. May it please thee this day to draw to thyself the hearts of those who struggle and endure to the uttermost. Have mercy on them and suffer not their faith in thee to fail. Guide and protect them by thy light and strength that they may be kept from evil. May thy comfort be sufficient for all who suffer pain or await in the agony of uncertainty. O righteous and omnipotent God, who in their tragedies and conflicts judges the hearts of men and the purposes of nations, enter into this struggle with thy transforming power, that out of its anguish there may come a victory of righteousness. May there arise a new order which shall endure, because in it thy will shall be done in earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us and cleanse us, as well as those who strive against us, that we may be fit instruments of thy purpose. Unto thy most gracious keeping, we commend our loved ones and ourselves, ascribing unto thee praise and glory, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Band-Aid, Johnson & Johnson's adhesive bandage was happy to relinquish its commercial time on today's program, so that Mr. Hill could give you a fuller report of the vital war news. This is Dan Seymour speaking for Band-Aid, and this is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Everybody. Tonight's communique just in from Invasion Headquarters summarizes the news of all the successful landings. Allied forces, it says, have succeeded in their initial landings in France and fighting continues. The communique goes on with air action, saying that all day Allied planes continued their bombing in what the dispatch calls very great strength. Another bulletin states that a German counterattack is in the making. It says... The first German counterattack is likely to materialize within the next 48 hours. And another bulletin just in emphasizes the element of surprise, saying that the Nazis were caught off their guard in an effective surprise by the Allied forces. Well, the news pictures Allied troops battling in the streets of the Norman city of Caen. That place is nine and a half miles inland, which represents a drive of that far from the beachheads established early this morning. The Germans tell us that the landing forces are broadening and strengthening their positions and getting incessant reinforcements. New masses of troops, new tons of armament pouring ashore. 
Caen is at the base of the Norman Peninsula, which thrusts northward into the English Channel, and the drive to the town makes it look as if the strategy were to cut across the base of that peninsula and force a Nazi withdrawal from the whole area. The possession of that peninsula would mean a powerful base from which allied thrusts could be driven inland, probably in the direction of Paris. To the British troops in the Second Front forces, that town of Caen represents historic memories. That is, if they have time to think about it. For it was there in the river that William the Conqueror in 1066 assembled his fleet with which he invaded Britain, the Norman Conquest, and the mortal remains of the Conqueror lie interned in the church of saint Etienne in the city of Caen. The latest advices from both sides allied an enemy picture the invasion as concentrated at three points, the mouth of the Orne River, where Caen lies, and 40 miles westward along the coast, the mouth of the Vere River. That point, too, threatens the base of the peninsula, and the Germans report that the Allied troops have cut an important highway still further along. Nazi accounts tell us that there have been landings also in the area between Boulogne and Calais. The Dover Straits, across the narrowest width of water from Britain. The German radio is quoted as saying that Allied airborne troops have seized a flying field in that sector, although there is no Allied confirmation of this so far. It so happens that the coastal battlefield is one of the most familiar stretches of ground on this earth. The French Channel shore from Cherbourg to Le Havre, for many years one of the commonest routes of travel for American tourists visiting Europe. They often landed at Cherbourg. And then the railroad to Paris took them along the coastal lands. I myself have made that railroad trip many a time and have seen the coast from the waterside. Flat country, only slight rises of ground from the beaches. Cherbourg itself on a tall, rugged headland a strongly fortified harbor just below. And around Calais and Dieppe, there are cliffs, like those white cliffs of Dover right across the channel. But in between the Calais-Dieppe area and Cherbourg, the beaches are broad and flat, and the level ground extends on inward, a water-level route to Paris. And so, any of the thousands of travelers who have made the railroad trip will appreciate the statement in the invasion news coming in that the most favorable stretch of coast was selected for the second front landings today. The events of today were studded with records, too. The greatest fleet of ships ever to set sail. 4,000 ships and thousands of lesser craft. The greatest army ever to strike at a hostile shore. That vast force of men and machines, tens of thousands of men increasing to hundreds of thousands, millions before it is over. And the greatest air assault ever delivered. Before the day began in the hours of darkness, between midnight and dawn, thousands of British planes hurled more than 5,000 tons of bombs on the Nazi fortifications. Then more than 1,000 American heavy bombers took up the assault, and soon the total tonnage of bombs was more than 11,000. A British air officer remarks that the total tonnage of bombs dropped in this one day of invasion was greater than the amount that the Germans hurled on Britain during the entire six months of the Great Blitz. The most colorful news of the day concerns the paratroopers. Those airborne forces which struck behind the Nazi Atlantic walls in advance of the landing of the seaborne soldiers. A United Press correspondent who witnessed invasion scenes from the coast of England describes the sky as looking like what he calls a Christmas tree with colored lights strung out in long lines. These, he goes on, were the running lights of the planes carrying airborne troops. The lights were to identify them to anti-aircraft batteries in Britain. Wave after wave of these airborne fleets, he relates, passed over the coast in a steady stream, their colored lights beaming and finally vanishing as they disappeared over the channel in the direction of France. In that first wave of paratroopers was an outfit which reminds you of American history of times gone by. Indians, yes, Indians, wearing their tribal scalp locks. They restrained their tribal war hoop, however, while descending silently, parachuting to earth. Then all of their ancestral stealth was needed when they got down as they spread out over the country today. Their job needed the stealth of the braves of times gone by. For these Indians, landing in France today, were Yaqui and Cherokee tribesmen. They were demolition engineers whose task it was to sneak in and blow up enemy installations. One of the paratroopers to jump today was Robert Hillman of Hartford, Connecticut, who felt an especial sense of security. This story, by the way, has wired me by an old friend, Ted Shane of the Black Watch, author of a book called Heroes of the Pacific. Shane tells how recently Private Hillman said to a colonel at inspection, I know my chute is okay because my mother checked it. She works in the Pioneer Parachute Company in our town, and her job is giving the final ones over to all the chutes. 
Prime Minister Winston Churchill's formal report on D-Day was given in tones of measured optimism in two statements to the House of Commons, the second of which recited the progress of events up to mid-afternoon. Sober and factual tones made his disclosures all the more encouraging. This operation, said Winston Churchill to the Commons, is proceeding in a highly satisfactory manner. And then he went on, Many dangers and difficulties which last night seemed to be extremely formidable are behind us. Passage of the sea, he exclaimed, has been made with far less loss than we apprehended. And he went on to say that the bristling batteries of Nazi guns across the channel had been greatly weakened by air bombing and the fire of naval artillery. And Churchill emphasized in these words, landings and follow-ups are proceeding with very much less loss than we expected. However, Churchill went on with his usual note of realistic caution. All this, he said, although a very favorable and vitally essential first step, cannot indicate what may be the course of battle in the next few weeks, because the enemy will endeavor to concentrate in this area. And in that event, heavy fighting, said Churchill, will soon begin and will continue without any end so long as the enemy can push troops in. This is, however, he concluded, the most serious time, and we enter upon it with our great allies, all in good heart and good friendship. President Roosevelt this afternoon added his own warning against overconfidence. He pointed out that it is one thing to land successfully on enemy beaches and another to drive the long, hard miles to the heart of the enemy country. The president said that the decision to launch today's blow was made last December at the Churchill-Stalin-Roosevelt Conference in Tehran. It was then decided that the Second Front would get underway toward the end of May or the first days of June. No exact date could be fixed because that depended on accidents of weather. The President added that he himself had known the exact date, Tuesday, June 6, 1944, only during these past few days. So he knew it last night when he was on the radio. The President says that while he was on the air making his broadcast concerning the fall of Rome, he was aware that the invasion boats already were on their way across the English Channel. One of the tense turns of drama was enacted today in a motor trailer under a tent somewhere along the southern coast of England. The trailer, headquarters of General Ike Eisenhower. From this, he will direct the onslaught until the Allied command crosses the channel and sets up headquarters on French soil. So early this morning, there was the ruddy-faced and ordinarily smiling Eisenhower. But he was tense now in a moment of his great decision. It was for him to give the order for the hurling of the second front. Was this the time? Should he set the whole vast offensive into operation? That was a question of weather. It had been noticed that during the past 48 hours, the usual Eisenhower posture had been head cocked up, looking at the sky. D-Day had been scheduled for yesterday, but no, it did not take one of those Eisenhower looks at the sky to see that the weather was bad, stormy, bad for flying, impossible for paratroop operations, channel too rough for the efficient handling of boats. The general's glances upward were a quest for signs of clearing, harbingers of better weather. So what were the prospects for today? Eisenhower and the top-ranking commanders studied the weather reports, the weatherman being the real commander-in-chief for the declaration of D-Day. The meteorological reports turned out to be good enough, but the weather today was by no means perfect. Not too good for bombing fleets of the sky, though these did a huge and devastating task. The channel was quieter than yesterday, though still choppy. That turbulent strait, whose seasickness-producing antics are a legend. For the airborne assault, the question of weather was the most critical of all. Things have got to be just right for dropping paratroopers in the dim break between darkness and dawn. Well, all of these chances were a weighty burden on the mind of the commanding general who had to decide, go ahead or delay again. Eisenhower has ample heart and courage for making a decision, and he gave the fateful order, D-Day. Surely he had enough to occupy the mind of any one man, enough to monopolize every thought in his head. And yet I wonder whether his fancy did not stray, at least for a brief moment, to this side of the ocean. I wonder, did he stop and think for a moment of that tall bluff on the broad river, with the height crowned by stately buildings? Did he think of West Point and his wife and his son? For it's a moody coincidence that this invasion day, which Eisenhower marked down in history, was also a graduation day at West Point and his son John was one of the graduating class. His mother was there to see him get his diploma, while his father was over there, commanding on D-Day. In Soviet Russia, the invasion news was announced with all the military fanfare that attends the proclamation of a great Red Army victory. And today's Moscow dispatch tells us 
that the Russian people exploded with an outburst of joy greater than they usually accord their own triumphs. Everywhere in Moscow, the hope was expressed that the war would end quickly now, and the Red Army seems about to do its own large bit toward that happy consummation. The word is tonight that the Russians will launch another big offensive of their own within 24 or 48 hours, almost certainly before the end of this week. The second front to be supported by a new big push on the first front. As for the war news from Italy, of course it's eclipsed by the much greater events along the English Channel. We may note, however, that yesterday's action still continues, the Fifth Army driving rapidly forward with the Germans in full retreat. For a brief while, the battle front was along the historic river Tiber, from Rome to the sea. But with only the briefest pause, British and American troops were across the Tiber, which for all its venerable reputation is no great stream, according to American standards. From the river, the advance pushed on along a 17-mile front, and so much for Italy. Well, the nation here at home today took the D-Day news with a feeling of earnestness and hope. Everywhere, people were soberly repeating the exclamation of a sergeant as his boat pushed off in that dim light this morning. They can't stop us, so said the sergeant. Many an amusement feature was shut down today because of the feeling that it wasn't appropriate to the news that was flashing in. Typical was a Marine Corps sergeant at Hollywood in the early hours of the morning. He had just won a jitterbugging contest in a nightclub, and he was beaming. And then he heard the news, and he said sheepishly, I feel sort of silly. One of the oddities is the fact that at Reno, that wide-open Nevada town, the gambling houses closed down today. Across the land, there were demonstrations of patriotism. At Philadelphia, the Liberty Bell rang, that symbol of American freedom. And in numberless churches, the bells pealed out, calling people to prayer. Over in England, the appeal to divine providence was led by the king, whose prayer concluded with a solemn cadence, We shall not ask that God may do our will, said the king, but that we may be enabled to do the will of God. And in this country, the president leads the nation in prayer tonight in the countrywide broadcast. Meanwhile, let's switch to Washington now to hear a voice that can speak an appeal with singular appropriateness. Chaplain Brigadier General William R. Arnold, Chief of the Chaplains of the United States Army. Almighty and eternal God, and it we, thy humble servants, are on our knees this fateful day to adore thee and to implore thy help. Thou who knowest the weakness and the frailty of our nature, hast shown us through the sufferings and sacrifice of thy beloved Son how to be brave and strong and victorious. As our fathers, sons, and brothers on distant battlefields fight valiantly for our liberties and for thy truth and justice, Graciously shed the light of thy countenance upon them, and sustain them by the power of thine unconquerable will. Send angels of thy heavenly host to lead them on to a glorious victory for thy honor and glory. Amen. And on that solemn note, we conclude one of the greatest days in the history of man, a day meant to mark the turning point of the global war. In years to come, the world and its history will tell again and again of this day, June 6th, D-Day, Invasion Day. And so long until tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Mm -hmm.